Hey guys, just a quick note before we begin that the show may contain spoilers and adult language, but that's just because we know how to have a good time. Stick around, you'll be glad you did. You are here for me to enlighten you. You ever act like this again, you're barred for life. It's just vile and base. It's kind of embarrassing. If you know your lines, then you can forget them. Oh, I get it. It's very clever. <laughs> Hello, peoples, and welcome to Esoterica Cinema, the podcast where we take films from the cinematic multiverse and discuss the hell out of them. I am the colloquially cumbersome Jason Peters, and with me, as always, is the man who currently owns and operates a Civil War-themed petting zoo, Mr. Ryan Siebold. What's up, Jason? How's it going, buddy? It is going pretty well, man. And uh, it's funny because, you know, I have a daughter and she's a little older these days to be taking her to petting zoos. But uh, yeah, she was actually uh, talking about how her friend's sister had recently gone to one. And then that made me remember that, like, that's kind of how you're making your cheese these days is you've got that crazy Civil War-themed petting zoo over there <laughs> in Florida. And I would just really like for you to take a moment and tell our oh. audience all about this crazy venture you've got going on. Civil War petting zoo. Okay, well, you know, look, what are petting zoos if not just slavery of animals, right? I mean, uh, that's <laughs> kind of the whole thing. Uh, and uh, you're right. I am, I'm down here in the glorified south of Florida. Um, it's... Uh, you know, Dixieland with palm trees. So <laughs> it seemed like a natural uh, extension of what I had going on down here in my living environment. Anyway, um, yeah, I... Uh, Interesting. Now, let me ask you. So uh, how exactly does one go... So first of all, we're not even going to get to the Civil War stuff. We'll get there in a minute. How did you acquire these animals? I would like to know. So you have to be really choosy on on the animals that you are going to charge to see. So, you know... Mm -hmm. You don't want, first of all, like right off the top, no, no bald eagles. Like that's American. Like you, you can't. I think they're extinct, dude. I don't think you can have bald eagles or they're not extinct, but they're endangered rather. Excuse me. Look, I've got a couple bald eagles. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is don't Florida, tell me. homie. You know, don't. If you want a bald eagle, I'll get you a bald eagle. I'll get eagle. you a bald eagle. I know a guy. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, you know, okay. most of the, most so, of the so eagles you, you see are just eagles in toupees because they, they're in hiding right now, but <laughs> really they're bald. If, if I may, sir, one thing that I would like to pitch, you may already have this going on out there, but like, if you're not already civil war reenactment, nothing but primates, right? And I, I don't know if you've got one set of primates, you know, maybe it's like, you know, uh, chimpanzees versus uh, gorillas on one side. That seems like it maybe be a little bit unfair. But uh, either way, like, I feel like, you know, it, kind of the way that Disneyland has that Main Street electrical parade that kind of comes out once or twice every night. Like, like, you know, you could have the whole sort of day's events culminate in this, like, giant Civil War reenactment. It doesn't even have to be just monkeys. I mean, you could literally take your entire flock, ascribe them to one side or the other, and uh, let them go to town. Just something to consider. I will definitely consider that. Yeah. <laughs> in the meantime, I believe you have a description of today's film. Why don't you go ahead and hit our audience up with that? I do. Today's film is from 1960 and director Michelangelo Antonioni. As we go back in time to horny as fuck Italian, <laughs> horny as fuck Italy, <laughs> uh, La Aventura. The description goes as follows in Michelangelo Antonioni's classic of Italian cinema to lovely young women, Claudia and Anna join the latter's lover, Sandro, on a boat trip to a remote volcanic island. When Anna goes missing, an extensive search is launched. In the meantime, Sandro and Claudia become involved in a romance despite Anna's disappearance, though the relationship suffers from the guilt and tension brought about by the looming mystery. Jason, ugh, this one is uh, like Uzo's Tokyo Story 3.0. This was one that I had to marinate on <laughs> and kind of sit on for a minute. Um, it took me a minute to adjust. This was not at all the film that I was expecting to see. Uh, we're going to get into all that, but before I do, I have to ask you as always, Jason, what did you think about this movie, buddy? 
Ryan, I am going to be very happy to tell you extensively all about my thoughts on this film. It's going to be a long one, guys. Strap in right after we hear this trailer for La Ventura. La Ventura, Michelangelo Antonioni's erotic adventure that travels from the core of human desire to the surface of casual passion, magnificently told against the lavish background of the affluent society of present-day Europe. La Ventura, unfolding in vividly etched scenes of unprecedented pictorial splendor and sensuality, the lives of a group of unsettled people in a constant, never-ending search for spiritual and physical fulfillment. Starring Monica Vitti as Claudia, the lonely one, finding momentary satisfaction where it was least expected, experiencing in a few short days a vitalized joy and a shocking realization of the truth. Gabriel Ferzetti as Sandro, the architect. Urban, sophisticated, driven to indulging himself in a perpetual search for satisfaction. Sandro, caught up in a consuming pattern of self-indulgence. Lea Massari as Anna, the fiance, whose withdrawn and mysterious behavior touched the lives of all who knew her and all who loved her. Dominique Blanchard as Julia, the frustrated, desperately reaching out, succumbing to the irresistible attraction of youth. La Ventura, winner of five international film awards, hailed by critics for its maturity and creative intuition, is a new experience in motion picture eroticism. Michelangelo Antonioni's La Ventura, a classic of modern filmmaking. Now, Ryan, I, I very much agree with you with regards to Ozu being a comparison for the film. Maybe not the film itself, but certainly my experience with the film. It sounds like yours as well. And the way in which the first consumption and first viewing of this film is going to kind of take you aback a little bit. It's not a traditional viewing experience. And same as you, I was expecting one thing, did not get that at all. Though I don't really see how anyone could necessarily expect this film if they hadn't already done a bunch of research ahead of time, which both of us have not. So we're going to go ahead and get into this very dense, complex film. There's a whole lot going on. There's a lot of claims that have been made about this film over the years with regards to its influence on the nature and language of cinema as a whole. I can't wait to discuss this with you. I just need a place for us to start, Ryan. At the beginning. Indeed, at the beginning. Now, when we open on this film, we have a an incredibly, almost impossibly crisp for 1958 when they shot this black and white shot of this woman walking away from a house. We will quickly learn that this is Anna, played by actress Leah Massari. Now, we dolly from a close-up, or from her walking away to a close-up of a tracking shot, and we can see that she's got this sort of like forlorn expression on her face as she walks outside of the house to meet her father, who is in fact a politician. Now, he's standing before a lower-class worker discussing the tearing down of a bunch of local buildings before he walks away, and turns to his daughter and asks why she's not on this trip yet. We sort of hear something about how she's supposed to be at sea for five days or so. And he actually goes on from there to say that she's being so difficult that like no man's going to marry her. But she retorts that, in fact, she has rebuffed a certain proposal of her own, something that we may just think is her kind of bullshitting with her father for a minute uh, until we get a few more minutes and realize that, oh, no, that was actually a very authentic comment. Now, Ryan. There is, again, so much to break down about this film. Right off the bat, like I said, we kind of are aware of the cinematography and the staging and the coverage. I, we're going to get to that in a minute. I don't want to get to that just yet uh, because okay. there's actually more significant aspects of this film in terms of how it applies to the history of cinema. And what I'm talking about is the fact that a number of people have described this, and I'm going to use this quote that's actually technically a paraphrase of three separate quotes, but all of these are quotes from people talking about this film. And that is that this film is, quote, an iconic and challenging masterwork through which Antonioni invented a new cinematic language. And that is like one of the most 
loaded and powerful statements you could make about a film. And it's not something that you can take lightly. So you and I, over the course of this discussion, in addition to everything else, are really going to analyze this, the nature of this statement, that it invented a new cinematic language. Okay. And before I continue, Ryan, have you, did you in fact hear that about this in your research? And if so, what is your response to that film, whether you heard it here for the first time or before? I did not hear about it going into the film, but I did see uh, things to that nature brought up in discussions about the film after I'd watched it. Yeah, doing the research and stuff like that. People really uh, gush about this. Um, you know, th this film, I'm sure we're going to get into this, was really poorly received at first, and then critics jumped on board, and then it was well-received. So audiences, because it was kind of a new language in, in the visual medium of cinema, uh, a lot of... I would think a lot of viewers came out of the theater not really knowing what they had seen. And even at Cannes Film Festival, sure, it was yeah. initially booed and panned uh, yeah. until certain people started to come away with something from it. Um, but it's it's a weird one. Again, this one took me a minute to kind of sit on, much like Tokyo Story did. Uh, where sure. well, I, well, let me ask you this, though, just like in terms of your specific, like your personal response. I don't really care about, you know, we'll, we'll talk about everyone else's response, but... Your specific response, if okay. having watched it, yep. You're so. Let me ask you all this as well, just to to be sure. Did you watch this film once or twice? I watched it once. Okay, yeah. So th th this film, everybody kind of acknowledges, and I can acknowledge because I did watch it a second time. It's a very different viewing experience on, uh, during its second viewing. Once you understand and have experienced, oh yeah, what it is and the way it right. tells its story because it's so unique. Yeah. So I would definitely say that. It's a film that requires multiple viewings to really understand. Yes. But a having seen it once and then having done your research without going into too much detail, do you think that's a fair statement or would you push back on somebody that attempted to say that? No, I think it's a totally fair statement. OK, yeah. Yeah, I was I was surprised to find that as well, because, again, someone tells you that you're about to watch a film that's a new cinematic language and you're like, OK, buddy, sure. Yeah, that's a that's a bold statement. Right. Get in line. And of course, we're watching this film in 2022, 62 years after it was re released. Right. So be, it's not going to be a new language to us. That language has since been spoken by other people and we've seen it there. But it is interesting to go back and see its genesis and really start to analyze that statement. And, yeah, I think it does hold water for the most part. I think I think you could kind of poke some holes in that a little bit. But I think it's unique enough to justify that statement. Now, to your point, Ryan, the audience in Khan that really, by the way, it's cans and I still call it cons to this day because it just sounds more elegant or refined or something. And I don't know that I will ever train myself out of it. So to whoa, anyone listening, whoa, 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 I know it's stop. not pronounced cons. I it's know it's cans? cans. It's cans. Yeah, that's Shut how you pronounce it. Shut the fuck up. Are you serious? I swear to God. Like, like a tin can, dude. It's called cans. Cans Film Festival. Then think about it. Uh, James Con, right? Two A's, one N. Cans, one A, two N. Yeah, but like, that's I'm, t I'm telling you, dude, look it up. You can look it up. If, if I'm geographically wrong, speaking, up James Kahn is from the same Cans? area. Yeah. He's from Cairns. <laughs> James Kahn from Cairns. <laughs> oh, way. Okay. Good. Yeah. 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 So anyways, you that uh, up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, again, so you do get the sense that, okay, if this, if this was some sort of new way of telling a story that people hadn't been accustomed to, of course, they're going to come out of it not having a, a good experience because they don't understand it the same way. If I had to try, if I tried to have a conversation with a Portuguese gentleman, it probably wouldn't go so well. Neither of us would have a good time because we wouldn't understand one another. Right. But that's why we have sort of, and this is the, this is where the critical community actually serves a benefit. Right. So often it's really easy to pile on critics, right? How many films did they not enjoy that are actually really good and well received and all of this. And when you have instances like this where there's a film that maybe isn't easy to understand its first time out, that's really where the critics come into play and say, hey, you know, give this film a second look. I went back. I did some work on it, you know, because that's my job and I found all this stuff on it. Let me go ahead and communicate that to you, give you some background that you can consider as you're watching this for a second time and see if it changes your opinion at all. And that so, definitely happened for me. Yeah. I mean, let's start with the fact that it's called The Adventure. 
and <laughs> there's not a whole <laughs> lot of adventure. It. Right, yeah. So you're kind of expecting <laughs> like... The other guy's full of shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's almost a parody. Like, the, the title of the film itself is almost a statement in and of itself. It's almost a, a parody of said adventure. Um, but, you know, because it's more about a statement about society. You know, you're going... I went into this film expecting, like, something kind of Hitchcockian, you know, um, in the way that... And it, and the whole first act leads you down that path. It kind of sends you down this wormhole that you're going searching for Anna. Sure. I know from the synopsis that I read on the last episode that, uh, you know, they end up in this relationship together and all of that. So I thought there was going to be the awkwardness of them finding Anna and like them having to, or maybe one of them killed her and it was all a setup or a stage. We're going to get into a whole plot. I don't mean to like, you know, jump right down into it, but yeah, I just, I, because this wasn't, you know, he kind of pulls the rug out from you at the end of act one and then sends you down this totally other way for acts two and three. And it's a brilliant film and it's, it's well crafted. It's, and he made it against all odds. We're going to get into all these little yeah. factoids about the film, but uh, just high level, if you're asking me about the language of the film or the experience of the film, um, I kind of felt on first pass uh, before I w went and did the the deep dive and the research that I, I kind of felt betrayed. Like I kind of felt as I'm watching yeah. this movie, I'm like, where is this Anna chick? Like what is going on? Why are we like paying attention to all this nothing and all these extraneous characters and people that don't matter are coming in and out of the show and like get back to the plot at hand. Did you get distracted? Like what's going on? <laughs> and um, you know, uh, but we never get back to that and because that's not yeah. what this movie is. And so I kind Correct. of felt like betrayed. I almost wanted to, there were parts of the film uh, if it wasn't so well made um, that I wanted to boo at as well. Now, I was enamored by the performances, by the cinematography, by the framing. The craftsmanship of this film was superb. Um, sure. But I would, uh, you know, in the top of the show, I kind of uh, equated this to Tokyo Story 3.0 or Ozu 2 3.0. Um, but that's because it's doing a lot of the same things. Uh, and making a lot of social commentary in the same way that Tokyo story did, but with camera Absolutely. movement, with a lot more um, attention to music um, with a lot more happening. It, it's a more robust film and you're going all over the place. You're not just trapped for the first hour of the film in uh, a home, you know, framed in, uh, in these corridors, like Tokyo story gave us, it felt very claustrophobic and you kind of just sit in these moments. This lets you free. And, um, and it, it kind of demonstrates almost a parallel to Tokyo story where Tokyo story Ozu sat you down to show you something. Uh, and you kind of felt imprisoned as he beat you over the head with this point, albeit wonderfully and, and an amazing point that he made. Um, this shows you, okay, you want to walk around the cabin, go for it. Like fucking go anywhere you want. You want to go to the beach? You want to go to an Island? Guess what? It all still sucks, pal. And you're like, Oh no. <laughs> so, you know, it shows you that, uh, you know, with all the money, Social freedom, you know, you could be in a convertible going by the coastline. You could be on a yacht going to an island. Doesn't matter. Uh, you're still lonely and um, and you're still sad and, and the world still is going to take you certain uh, places in your brain. You're going to feel how you feel. So uh, I thought it was a really interesting parallel to uh, the ride we just went on a couple weeks ago on Tokyo Story. So anyway, with that yeah. said, I'll let you kind of take it back and uh, we can start to chunk through this thing. What I found most comparable to Tokyo Story was the device that Antonioni used with regards to events unfolding and how they never or rarely show those happening on screen. Sure. You know, the ellipses. Instead of like, yeah, exactly. Exactly. 100 percent. Thank you. Uh, yeah. The narrative ellipses where it, you know most people would show this event because that's what you do, but not these guys because they're not interested in plot. They're interested in character. Right. And I think that's. You know, it's it, we 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 have so many indie films and character driven films these days that I think it can be easy to forget that once upon a time those didn't really exist. You know, right. and we can go ahead and, and take this moment to acknowledge that Antonioni was one of the foremost filmmakers advancing the form of neo realism, which was a reaction to World War II and the events that had taken place, and how you know because of the massive destruction and the way that it completely changed the fabric of their society you know everything pivoted from being this huge spectacle of bombast you know that would accompany right all of this very sort of dramatic national language that tends to accompany war and now it's you know let's focus on the 
psychological examinations of these characters, right? Which is a very trauma-based response. And I think if you look at it through that lens, it's easy to understand how a nation could be reeling from this huge protracted war that they did not win. And now they have to, you know, not only lick their wounds economically speaking and physically speaking, but also have a bit of a reckoning with regards to the fact that, uh, you know, they were not the victors. And and what does that say about our direction and where we came from and all of this? So right. it's really interesting to see the response there to the events that took place and how that affects the filmmaking. Yeah, man. I mean, this was uh, post-World War II Italy, right? And so yes. you're talking about Mussolini uh, only being killed, what, 15 years prior in 1945. Um it's weird, you know, you talk about the, the 60s and all of these things and, and you start to think about, uh, it's it's easy to forget how closely this was to some of the events of World War II, you know? Like, we had talked about Tokyo's story, you know, a, a big chunk of that happened, I mean, it all took place in Japan, but then the parents came over from Nagasaki, right? So, and that was like eight years removed. So this is eight years removed from the um, uh, death of Mussolini in Italy, um, 15 years isn't that long. I mean, it's 20, yeah. 22 right now. So we're talking, you know, 2007, uh, that would have sure. happened if that, you know, by today's standards, that's not. And even know. the ideation of the script is going to happen much earlier, right? Cause I believe it was filmed in 58. So right. best case scenario, he's got it written, what, 56 or something like that. Sure. Right. Um, because he wasn't someone that just had, you know, funding lined up cause he wasn't commercially successful. So yeah, I mean, they could have very, very well been, you know, eight years you know, or even sooner, who knows, maybe that was, maybe he had, I don't know how long he had the script gestating, but yeah, certainly the ideation of it is close enough to the events that it's felt throughout the film. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's really, you know, it's something that gets swept under the rug or or forgot about sometimes that, uh, because we're way over here in America and so far removed from major events like world war two or Vietnam at this point, but, uh, 15 years, isn't that, isn't that long? That was right in there. In their backyard, so... Absolutely. Now, one of the other aspects of the film that was considered revolutionary, and I wanted to see if this came up in your research as well, but the whole notion of this film being a metonymic film, is this is this a term that came across in your research, Ryan? Never heard that word before in my life. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I do think it holds merit. Like, I think that, you know, maybe the degree to which the film employs this, like, it's not 100% ironclad. But there are people that say that this is the first what they call metonymic film. OK, and metonyms are actually a literary device. Uh, and uh, metonymy is actually where we use real world examples to stand in for a much larger entity. And so three right off the bat that we're all going to be familiar with, the Oval Office, Wall Street, Silicon Valley, right? These are not metaphors in the traditional sense because they are based on actual physical tangible realities that relate to that concept. So the Oval Office being representative of government and politics and the presidency that the, the Oval Office actually exists. Wall Street, again, that's where those people actually do their business. Silicon Valley, same thing. So this is different from a metaphor, which would be something completely different that is standing in for the thing itself, right? So, you know, we have a, a piggy bank, right? We call it oh, the piggy bank, and it refers to stockbrokers, but that's that's a metaphor, whereas calling it Wall Street based on where these people really work would be what we call a metonym, which I believe is is a mashup of meta- metaphor and synonym because it's a metaphor that means the same thing is kind of how I interpret that. OK, so how that applies to this film, the argument here with regards to this being a metonymic film is the fact that there is so much visual representation and so much that the background buildings, characters, settings, environment, etc., is trying to communicate to you. However, the message that it's trying to communicate is not a metaphor. In in this film, it is argued that all of the, everything you are presented with is supposed to be that thing, okay? So for example, when we see the, the, the destroyed buildings in that opening shot with the politician in the background, and then to the left, we see some of the new apartments that have been built, 
Like that's not supposed to be – that's not a metaphor for what's going on. That is actually happening, right? Okay. The, 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 the crumbling building is not supposed to be, again, a metaphor for his crumbling relationship. It is actually – a, a metonym for the fact that this is a world in re-repair, right? That was broken down and is trying to be built back up. We see this in certain moments later. So do you remember the moment towards the end of the film where Sandro knocks over the ink on the artist's paper and yeah. gets all pissed off? Yeah. So He's like, you did it on example- purpose. He's like, no, I was an accident. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So – So using that as another example, right, it's argued that, okay, so that was a very childish move, right, by Sandro. It was a childish response to his jealousy and response to the girl. And so immediately after he does that, he has a moment where we see a number of children walking out of seminary school, right? And he joins in that profession, that procession rather, as he's walking away. So he's literally like acting, he's acting as a child and then joins up with children to leave illustrative of the fact that he is being a child, right? So there's, again, so it's like they're metaphors, but they're almost like they're they're direct metaphors. They're not creative metaphors. They are the thing that they are, which is why they are called metonyms. Right. Okay. So So I'm going to stop you right there because this is the part of the movie that I hated. (laughs) Okay. Um, I think that, so I think that Antonio made a lot of intentional decisions, uh, some of mm-hmm. which I liked, some of which I didn't. I think that his uh, statements uh, and social commentary that he was making about uh, the class system and the passage of time and how cold and distant everybody uh, was to each other and how everybody was just kind of using each other and all of that. We're going to get into some of that as we get down the way in the plot. Um, I don't want to jump too far ahead. But sure. There are other decisions that were kind of, in, again, not to keep referencing this episode, but we talked to, I talked about some of this in Tokyo story as well, in the sense that there are a lot of critics that are kind of up their own ass about how everything has to mean something. And, mm-hmm. you know, the, the you know, the, the painting, you know, three rooms down on the corner, that's all blurry, but that's this painting and that signifies this thing and blah, blah, blah. Or the way that this one kid was dressed in the far corner that's out of focus or whatever is signified of, you know, Russia and their stance and post-World War Two European, you know, affairs. And it's like, so I, I felt like on the surface, the statements that Antonioni was making um, through the cast and through the cinematography and through the plot itself or lack thereof, we're all great. And I really appreciate this film and the genius. But I do feel that sometimes critics pick apart these movies too far and they try to find meaning in things that, you know, sometimes the cigar is just a cigar or whatever the state statement is. Um, I kind of feel like in this particular case, everything did mean something. And Antonio was making the movie for those people. And what it did was it made me feel lost as the viewer. Like they, there was so much I could pick apart. Like you could go for hours and watch behind the scenes shit or like people pick apart this movie. And usually I would critique that and be like, dude, you're looking way too far into this. It's a good movie, whatever. Um, and, and some of these, you know, entertainment sometimes should just be meant to stand on its own two feet. It's either a good movie or a bad movie. But in this particular case, I did in genuinely feel that Antonio was like, Oh, you want to pick apart some shit? I got you, fam. And he made this whole movie <laughs> and several after for those kinds of people that we're going to analyze yeah, and watch sure. his movies six times over and like look for the meaning in this and all of that. Because the further down the rabbit hole I went studying this film, um, I, for for starters, I was very impressed by uh, how much credence all these uh, all the symbolism and things, everything you're talking about right now is true. I f- full on agree that Antonioni, I believe personally, uh, did all these things very intentionally, but at sure. the same time, get the fuck over yourself. Like, dude, this is like, so you're every single layer of every single, uh, frame of celluloid has so much meaning. And I can just like pick apart all this stuff from all these things. And what it doesn't have is adventure and fun and all the, so this is a statement movie. It's brilliant. I love this movie for what it is, but 
holy crap, man, like the rabbit hole is so deep on this movie. And from what I understand, that's just the kind of filmmaker he was. So yeah, he's yeah. writing a whole new language. It's kind of like when people learn Elvish when they read the Lord of the Rings, Lord of the Rings. Great. <laughs> you know, like that's a great movie. I, you know, great book, all that Tolkien, badass. You want to read the Salamanalion? Fantastic. Go for it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but then like, you know, you have the people that are like, well, let's get into the third generation of elves. And I learned the language. And let me tell you, it's like, Oh shit. Like, <laughs> and then when you have to like, when you get into it, when you get to a point where, those things become necessary to truly appreciate a film. I got to draw a line in the sand and be like, bro, this ain't it. And it ain't me. You know, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, yeah. at I mean, what point do you a... say enough's enough? Like how many layers of symbolism and, and metonyms and all the things like it's just, it's a lot. It, it is a lot, but I would argue that. So did, have you heard it said, did you find in your research um, that, people refer to him as a, quote, novelistic filmmaker. Did you come across that statement at all? What was it? A novelistic filmmaker? No. Okay. And I think that's a very good way of looking at this, is that Antonioni was a big fan of literature. And it's been said that he basically spent his entire career trying to make movies that felt like books. And in books... You do take a lot more detours. You do spend time going into a random abode that's not what you're looking for and finding yourself over here and spending a little bit of time with these, you know, ancillary characters to flesh out the world, right? Those are the details of a novel that the form inherently provides room for, right? Movies, we don't have that much time. We've got to get out quicker. So a lot of that stuff has to go by the wayside. And so... It's been said that the reason that this movie contains all of those is because, again, he wants his movie to be dense. He want the you know it it, you, it could be said that like if what you say is true, he's not making this movie for you, you know. And there is that person that does want to learn Elvish and really gets off on it. And if you were that person, you would be super stoked that there was an entire Elven language in there that you could go learn because you love this world so much. Now, this world. Ryan, is not yours in my world at all. Yeah, it's doubtful it's really any American's world, right? It's, there's something about this world that feels very European and very specific to the cultural experience uh, in a way that differs from ours here in America. So I'm going to first off, I'm going to disagree with you um, on okay. just on the statement that Antonioni was trying to make. But we'll get that. We'll get to that down the road. Uh, there's zero chance I'm going to tackle that before we even talk about the plot of the film. <laughs> 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 All right, well let's let's uh, let's advance it a little bit forward then so we can but, get but, to that. But, so. to, before you do, I want to add okay. to your point. Um let's not forget that a book even by 1960 standards you can own and you could go back and reread or if there was something in the chapter that you think you missed, you could go back and and reference that. In 1960, home video did not exist, neither did streaming. So to rewatch these films and gather more out of them, I would argue was much more difficult. Um, not that he should be restricted or shackled from making the statements that he wants to make. Hey man, you're the artist, paint your painting. I get it, but don't expect me uh, in, you know, 1960s Italy or, or America to have the uh, wherewithal to, you know, experience your film over and over and over again. That's kind of a weird expectation to make in that I time frame. I don't know. I think that's, I think that's actually more of like a modern viewpoint because like, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, there were plenty of movies that I went to see in theaters in their limited time window many times. I think the, uh, I think the uh, record was for Independence Day. I think I saw Independence Day like five times in theaters or something like that. Jurassic Park was three. Titanic was three. So the thing is, yeah, we didn't have home video, but that's why your ass went to the movies. That's why the movies were so awesome because okay. you couldn't watch that shit at home, you know? And so that's why, you know, little little mini Tarantino and little mini Scorsese used to take their $7 and spend 12 hours at the movies, you know? That was your day. And I'm sure you could even argue that there was probably more free time available because you didn't have the same demands of work and family and all of that. So, I mean, I, I, I do understand what you're saying, but I also think that it was probably when I think back, I think it was probably more common to to 
go see a movie several times. Again, just thinking back to when I was a kid and did that all the time. When I was a kid. <laughs> Come on, dude. Times, remember? I saw Independence Day seven times because I'm that independent, <laughs> goddammit. <laughs> America. <laughs> yes. Now, it's so funny, dude, because I mean, what are we? We're at least half an hour into this episode, if not longer. And we've discussed, well, we've got like five minutes through the narrative. Hit the it. way this episode, just to everyone listening, there's, there's going to be a lot up front and then it's going to wrap up real quickly at the end so you know hang out with us we've got a lot to say about this film but uh we will but we'll run out of gas sooner or later, later. <laughs> <laughs> now getting back to the film uh, we see that anna's friend is with her outside and they're soon driven to this man's apartment who is sandro we soon learn that sandro is engaged to anna but anna actually doesn't want to be seen by sandro right off the bat she indicates that there's this notion of people being more romanticized when they are absent, right? The whole absence makes the heart grow fonder thing. Like the idea of someone is always going to be more than the actual person can live up to, which sure. is a very depressing viewpoint. That's basically my entire reason that I don't see or I don't learn about films ahead of watching them, right? Going in blind like I do. But like ascribe to people, that's a pretty – that's a much harsher sort of uh, disposition to have there. And it's especially weird where she has this expression and then she goes in and sees Sandro and is immediately like, yeah, you know what? I really want to take my clothes off and bang this dude. And it's like, weren't you just saying you didn't want to see him two minutes ago? And that in and of itself, right here we see two of the film's central themes. I would argue there's three central themes to the film. We're going to go ahead and tackle two of them right now, bring up one later. And I would say that up front this establishes the two – as the fact that we are dealing with nothing but self-absorbed characters. It could be argued up front that Claudia isn't, but I think that she is by the end of the film, at least. And when we say self-absorbed, by the way, just so that everybody understands, this is not to say that they are specifically selfish people, though in this case, I think they are. But it's important to remember that there is a distinction between the term selfish and self-absorbed. Selfish means your actions are only in your personal best interest, whereas being self-absorbed, you may not necessarily be a selfish person, but you can only see within the purview of your own world, right? You're so into what's going on in your head and nobody else's at any given time that you can never get out of that. You're constantly trapped in your own head thinking about your own world, not really considering the world around you. Sure. And I think that's what these people are. And then, yes, they are selfish as well, but that's not the statement. The statement is that they're so self-absorbed that they can never get outside of their own head to see any other viewpoint but their own myopic viewpoint. And then, of course, the second one, which I think is pretty on the nose. I don't know that anybody really needs to, to delve too far to see this, but just the whole notion of sexual escapism, right? That these people are not satisfied. Again, they're self-absorbed. They're in their head. They've probably got running monologues going on 24-7. And so this is sort of like their drug, right? We don't really see them drink too much. You know, they, they don't smoke super heavy, especially for the times. We don't see them do anything else. And so it's sort of like sex is their drug, right? Like that's what they get off on and they like doing it. And anytime it can sort of – when they do use it, it's to either break up the monotony or to just get outside of their head for a minute because they're so trapped in there. Sure. Uh, do you think those are – do you think that's fair to say? Yeah. Yeah. So again, you know, we 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 see it a couple different ways. Immediately after what's that, what's the third? You said there was. Did you say there's a third statement or no? There is a third. I'll, I'll bring I'll bring it up later because I, I don't want to examine it just yet. Right, I, I think right. it's I think it's better examined later. So we'll come back to it. <laughs> well, I, I will listen. I just don't want to get too far down the road. I mean, it, it's it, worth and this pertains to the plot, so we can get right back into the film. But uh, it is worth mentioning. These are all people. Uh, of a certain class, you know, this is a, a statement about the bourgeoisie and, and, uh, yes. you know, people yeah. of a certain stature. So these people all have money and they've all, they could all buy themselves out, you know, whatever they want or do whatever they want or go whatever, wherever they want. The movie opens up with them all taking a yacht trip, uh, to Sicily. And, uh, yeah, they're, they're people that can, uh, there are people of, of a certain means and so they're bored, you know, and so, you know, that's, I think what yeah. leads themselves to be self-absorbed and 
to find folly in using people and sexual encounters and all of that because uh, they're used to people being pawns. They're not used to being able to attach themselves emotionally to things or people. Um, You know, from the opening scene you described earlier, you know, uh, Anna and her father are totally discarding each other. You know, he even says like, I need to learn to disassociate myself with parenthood or something along those lines. And she's like, you don't mean that. He's like, no, I totally do. And she's like, totes. (laughs) And he's like, totes, bitch. (laughs) And then he goes, she goes off on this yacht or no. Then she goes and meets with Sandro, which is a scene right now. And then he's like, Oh, I missed you. Uh, By the way, total Pepe Le Pew energy. This guy fucking whole movie. One we'll hundred percent. I have I have that listed. I literally made that same note. Heavy <laughs> so he's like, you know, all over. And he's, she's like, no. <laughs> he may as well no. just be bouncing after her, right? Yeah, like. <laughs> right. And, and he's, he's she's like, no, we shouldn't. And then he's she's like, oh, let's just. Actually, I do. I totally want a bone. I want to go to the bone zone with you. And and he's like, okay, well, that's weird. And she's like, yeah, I didn't want it before, but now I kind of do. So these people are all acting on impulse. Boom, boom, boom. Like, I want it now. I don't now. I want you. I don't. I'm going to marry you. Nope. I'm going to bang your friend. These people are all just like totally impulsive, doing whatever sure. feels good in the moment. And I think that's, uh, again, a statement on their place in society, the upper crust and people of means yeah. that... Having all the money in the world isn't going to answer your problems. Just because you have means, now you got to find new challenges. Now you got to find things that interest you because going on that yacht trip to the rocks of Sicily ain't that cool no more. Like you and I would be totally stoked going on a trip that they're about to go on. Or if you haven't seen your lover in a month, you'd be like, oh, baby, I missed you so much. Like, I love you. But they're like, eh. Whatever, Uh, you know, I got you today. I could have someone tomorrow. Like, this isn't special to me. It's all on the surface. I can't get my emotions involved. Fuck, my own dad just told me he didn't really care. So what is love? Baby, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me no more. (laughs) (laughs) Now, the interesting thing is we see them leave for vacation. And after some rather aggressive driving from Sandro, we get a quick dissolve. And all of a sudden, they're on the boat in the ocean. And so, again, this is... Very reminiscent of what we talked about, the narrative ellipses with Ozu skipping past those plot points that other filmmakers would focus on. Sure. And because it's, again, it's not about the plot. It's about the characters. So this is just action. We don't need to show that. Let's get right to the parts where my characters can emote and have reactions. Right. And yes, you know, we do see that right off the bat, they're these wealthy, bored characters, right? That's not specific to Italian cinema. We have plenty of characters and have examined this in American cinema. It's almost a stereotype of the bored, rich housewife or son or whoever is not running the family business, right? They're always, just, huh, I'm bored and all this money and life sucks. Blah, blah, blah. So <laughs> we definitely see more of that. Like, like this is the Italian version of those people, right? Introduced to them on the yacht where Sandro yells at some adorable little dog who's just trying to cuddle up to him to get the hell off of him and the you know rich heiress of sorts complains about sleeping poorly and you know we again it's all you know and then sandro's tearing off magazine papers and just throwing them casually into the ocean like rich these people guys don't problems. give a shit exactly right. and 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 as well this is another point that uh, you know a critic would argue is one of those metonyms right where these are people literally floating through life right <laughs> on this yacht and so <laughs> wow yeah i didn't thought about that i will yeah, say that yeah. i i read that uh again we kind of touched on this at the top of the show but this movie was made kind of against all odds uh funding got pulled uh right after they started shooting this thing oh, yeah. he lost all his money he had to go find other money they had to shoot off season because obviously italy and sicily are pretty big vacation spots even back then. So they had to shoot in the winter when it was like super cold out. So everyone was like freezing their nards off and it was super uncomfortable to be out there. But, uh, I will add that this is the, probably the only spot in the movie where I noticed the lack of funding because that was a very small yacht and they went down under the (laughs) hull to go to the sleeping quarters and there was room for just a few people. So I was like, dude, I think there's like six to eight people on this boat. They said they, they, uh, slept overnight to get there. Um, on the trip. So I was like, you know, what are they just all in a big rich people puppy pile down there? Just all, you know, <laughs> cuddled up. Cause there is one bedroom. I've been on boats like that. Uh, and there's not as much room as you think. That was not a yacht. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's go, let's go ahead and, and, and dive into that one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> not a metonym. <laughs> 
<laughs> and uh, so, yes, on this yacht, we've got all the people that we mentioned, as well as this couple, a married couple, Corrado and Julia, who I believe only exist to talk shit about the concept of marriage. Oh, yeah. And illustrate how horrible it actually is. Yep. And you know what? I guess, Ryan, now I'll go ahead and drop that third theme here. Here we go. Uh, we're going to discuss it later, but it, it ties into this. Which is, and he's actually gone on record as saying this, uh, that one of the themes of this film is the impossibility of relationships. Yeah. He is just one of these right. people that believes that long-term relationships, marriage, fundamentally cannot exist between people. And this is an examination of that. And I think that, again, without delving too deep into that, we'll save that for the end. Sure. Certainly the Corrado and Julia couple serve that purpose. I yeah. think that's pretty clear. And and I got some some commentary to say about that. So we'll touch on that later. Okay, yeah. So now, funny thing. So Anna gets frustrated very initially, uh, possibly because she's tired of the rich people complaining things, but more than likely because she's got something else swimming in her own head. Ah, two puns swimming in her <laughs> head, man. All for you, buddy. All for you. Yes, he shoots, he scores. <laughs> now, let me ask you, actually, I don't know if this came up in your research, if you noticed it in the moment or anything, but the scene, if you recall, where, where Anna, we see her back and she dives into the water yep. as the boat's moving. Did you notice anything a little off about that shot at all? Well, it wasn't her. She was in the hospital with like a coma or something, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that is actually not Leah Masari. That is the assistant director which, if you're wondering, yes, it's a male. That is a male in a bathing suit jumping into that water that I didn't think for a second was not her. Uh, and that's <laughs> actually very interesting because Antonioni has gone on record and he actually utilizes this throughout all his films as saying that when you strip down people to being completely naked, that they look a lot more similar to one another than they do when they're dressed and that this is actually intensified when you turn people around. So, like, there's that one shot coming up pretty soon where Anna and Claudia get dressed in the yacht and they have their backs to the camera. And as they, you know, as we see their backs in their form, we 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 notice that that they wow, those they actually do look very similar just in terms of their physical stature and such. Yeah, man, a butt's a butt. <laughs> <laughs> Regardless, though, to your point, this was supposed to be shot in the summer. But they couldn't shoot it until November. And by shooting in November, the weather was completely different. So it was incredibly cold. It was incredibly windy. And the water was freezing. Yeah. So they were actually shooting some footage with Leah Masari. And they had her in the water for 90 minutes, at which point something very dramatic happened. And she developed a cardiac condition. And they had to, like rush in and take her out and take her to a hospital where she actually was in a coma right. for like three days. Yeah. From what I understand until they, until they got her out. So yeah, while she was there lying in a coma, they're like, all right, next up assistant director, let's go. We got yep. stuff to do. Now, why did, why did <laughs> you they shoot bring in me the boy, the boy, sir, <laughs> you, <laughs> you're the boy. <laughs> now, why did they shoot in November instead of the summer? Because the owner of the yacht, did not make it in time. He, he was supposed not to. They were scheduled for summer. <laughs> Owner of the we're SS puppy pile. We're going to call it a yacht. Uh, he was able. So he actually showed up in November, the owner of this. Now, I, I don't know if you saw this or not, um, but did you see that that they spent 20 days shooting the yacht scenes and, and why it was specifically 20 days? No. OK, so. So, first of all, one thing I got, this Antonioni guy, like, does not care about your schedule at all. He doesn't care if you're owed money for right. your time. He Let's... is on Antonioni's time and Antonioni's time alone. Okay, real quick, I'm just going to throw in <laughs> two two things. I have uh, been to Italy many, many a times, and uh, uh, they don't give a fuck about your schedule to this very day. So, <laughs> yeah. They're always running late. That's why traffic is bonobos in Rome because they're like, you know, stereotypically late all the time because they're like, oh, we'll do it later. And they're, you know, fuck it. Yeah. They're just all on, the, on their own time, which is a great way to go through life unless you're trying to get a movie made, in which case, uh, <laughs> you know, it's a lot of fun when you're there on vacation, but uh, not so much when you're trying to work and you're out of money. <laughs> I could, yeah, I can imagine that. Now, Antonioni told the owner of the yacht that he would need it 
for 10 days. And then 10 days turned into 12, to 14, to 18. On the 20th day, they wake up to go film another yacht scene, except lo and behold, the yacht and its owner are gone. The guy got so pissed off that they kept oh, taking shit. more and more time that in the middle of the night when everyone was asleep, he, he titched that shit up and bailed and took off. And so th- that was the end of the yacht scenes. Whatever they had at that point was whatever they oh, had. Oh, wow. So, you know, and you know, it's funny. It wouldn't, it wouldn't, I, I'm not saying this is the case at all. Wouldn't it be funny though, if it turned out that the whole reason that Antonioni employed a narrative ellipsis for the launch of the boat was that he had the launch filmed last and the yacht was gone. <laughs> and so what? it was like, well, artistic decision time. <laughs> 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 but yeah, so uh, that, you know, again, right. That's the thing about filmmaking. A lot of times circumstances dictate what you can and can't get. And sure. if the owner of your yacht says you're done, guess what? You're done. You're Unless done. You can come up with more money, which they certainly could not. Now, Everyone joins Anna in the water. They all jump in as well. But she very quickly claims that there's a shark and starts swimming back to the boat. We're a little suspect about this claim, as are the people on the boat, thinking it's probably some bullshit. Turns out, yeah, it's some bullshit. She very quickly admits to her friend Claudia, who is not yet the main character, that uh, she made it up, probably for attention. She doesn't really know why, nor does she care. By the way, Ryan, as someone who's a little bit more familiar with boats, is there... Like, are there – okay, so let's say not this quote-unquote yacht, SS dinghy, whatever. But in a traditional yacht, are are they still referred to as rooms the same way like you would refer to rooms in a house? Like is there like bedrooms and kitchens or are there like nautical terminology for that? I mean there – you can go down to the cabin or whatever. Yeah. But I would say there's – you could say rooms if you want. And I will also add that uh, these people aren't – yachtsmen they're just rich fucks with money so if they want to call it a room they can call it a room like that's fine we'll let that slide okay yeah no that was that was just for my personal knowledge because i i'm i am not a boatman uh yeah i, I not... mean someone could call me out on my bullshit i'm not a boatman either i've just been on boats a lot but yeah i mean yeah no i know you, you have more than i have you might hear someone say i'm going to the galley or i'm you know heading down to the cabin or something along those lines i guess but see if uh, i hear galley i picture like a bunch of dudes in a submarine Okay. And I don't know why. I, again, this is, this could be off nothing, right? Uh, my own dumb assumptions or whatever. But uh, Yeah, I think you go down way, below. We don't need to spend a lot of time on it. I was just curious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but there is not yeah. like – they're treating this some bitch like it's like, you know, there's multiple rooms and I got to go down a hallway and make a right and take the elevator down. It's like, no, nah, dude. That's yeah, like – it's like there's a small cabin down there. That's, that's like a 20-footer. It. Yeah, you barely got yeah. one room down there <laughs> and maybe now, a little kitchenette and a bathroom. And you got what, like six to eight people on there counting the ca- uh, captain and uh, first mate? So some people are sleeping up topside. Absolutely. Maybe that's why they're grumpy. Maybe they didn't sleep very well. <laughs> Bunch of grumps. Now, this is where we get that scene where the two of them do change. And I think it's interesting to note that this is an example of some really effective foreshadowing, right? Because sure. th- basically, Aunt, uh, Anna is like, oh, I don't like this shirt. She gives it to Claudia and they exchange clothes. Right. And over the course of the film, once Sandro and Claudia get into a relationship, what we're going to find is that she, sh- she sort of very – gradually almost becomes a surrogate for Anna, not just in the way that she has the relationship with Sandro and not just in the way that her personality develops, but even physically going so far as to don like a dark wig that's short and starts to dress more like her. So a really nice example of uh, some foreshadowing there. And the other aspect that this scene addresses that I would like your opinion on is and you can tell me if this is an entirely new concept to you or if this came about in your research as well. When we watch this scene, we do notice that in Anna's face and her behavior, there is a distinctly sexual charge that she brings to her discussions with Claudia. To the oh, point yeah. that I think it even makes Claudia a little bit uncomfortable, right? Yes. And it has been suggested that this scene exists to communicate to us that Anna is in fact gay and that is part of the reason that she ultimately leaves, does whatever she does, goes missing. But that, that, that 
this scene is indicating that she's a lesbian and that's a large part of the reason that she doesn't want to be ultimately with Sandro. What do you think about that idea? Uh, I can't say I really gave it much thought. I did notice the sexual tension between them. Um, sure. I think that I will say that fortunately we're a little more accustomed to seeing stuff like that. So maybe it's a little more apparent to us today. Um, or maybe not, maybe it stood out by comparison, um, because you know, uh, the LGBTQ community wasn't as widely represented in 1960, maybe in Italy, but, yeah. uh, I, I don't think so. So yeah, maybe just, you know, he was trying to make a comment there. I don't know. Um, I sure. will say I noticed the flirtations, um, but it was also kind yeah. of just like schoolgirl flirtations too, right? They're like, don't I look cute in this and this and that? Now for me, you know, I don't think that this is necessarily indicating that she is 100% a lesbian. I think that she's probably bisexual, at least by nature, if not in practice. And perhaps well, dude, I mean, this whole movie is, time is very sexually liberated, that. you know? This, sure. Yeah. So, but I think uh, more good. I just thought, you know, I think that this movie is very sexually liberated and we, and to, we made this point earlier that these people are bored. They're looking for ways to be excited or stimulated yes. and, 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 and push their own boundaries and, um, you know, get some kind of a, th- a whisper of a thrill. So, uh, you yeah. know, I, I kind of got, that's, that's kind of a running what theme I was leading to, throughout. Yeah. Um, you know, we're going to get to a point here, uh, in the next little bit where you totally have someone like trying to bang a 17 year old boy. So, you know, not trying, I'm pretty straight sure up. that they have, she absolutely does. Even absolutely. though we don't see it. Yeah. <laughs> but so, yeah, no, I think this is just more of a reinforcement of the theme that we identified earlier. Correct. Of sexual escapism. And I don't sexual think they escapism, really. Sexual escapism, trying to we, find we, some we, kind of a charge when everything, you know, you have the whole uh, world in your grasp, um, then what do you do for excitement? And then that's what this whole yeah. movie kind of displays and lays out. We've even seen those characters where they're not strictly bisexual because of any, you know, political or socio political choice or anything like it's just because they're rich and bored. Right. And they'll bang anything that walks. Right. Or comes across like it's not about the banging or the attraction. It's about, oh, can I at least give myself a few minutes of pleasure in this otherwise dull day? Right. Like so it's it's totally that character. Well, and then, you know, know, in the context of the chaste, you know, American version of the 1950s. Uh, you know, we were taught that, you know, this was right, this was wrong, blah, blah, blah. But then you go back and we start to like dig through these old Hollywood archives and you find out like Errol Flynn was banging everybody and Marlon Brando was fucking everybody and (laughs) Paul Newman was having threesomes and has a fuck hut, you know, room in his house. And it's like, oh, okay. You guys just weren't letting us do it. You guys were all doing it. (laughs) Cool. So, you know, that's kind of, you know, uh, that's what I'm taking from this whole film is Antonioni pulling the lid off of, the upper crust of society and saying, you see, you know, and and kind of showcasing the, like you said, the self-absorbed, the lack of uh, communication or attachment, the sexual uh, frivolousness of it all. And, and, uh, and how everybody's just doing whatever they can to try to get that charge. You know, it's like when you're an alcoholic uh, and you can't get drunk anymore, it's like, you got to like find new ways or a drug addict. You're like, I got to get that high, you know? So you got to like push the boundaries further and further to, get that initial, you're always chasing that first, uh, you know, bit of excitement that you got from whatever you're dosing on. And in this case, they, they have overdosed on life <laughs> and, and, uh, all the thrills of, of thereof, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, after a quick scene that introduces us to Raimundo and Lady Patrizio, who are really minor characters that I don't really think influence the film enough for us to really delve into. If you feel otherwise, you could certainly bring that up in a moment. But they're just kind of there uh, to further reinforce these very sort of rich, apathetic people. Now, Anna wants to talk to Sandro. They fi- well, first of all, let's just let's just acknowledge that we finally arrive at the island here. We're only like <laughs> half an hour into this movie. It's like a two and a half hour movie. It's like half an hour into the movie. And we're like well over an hour into this discussion. This is how dense this film is. Again, this doesn't mean it's going to be a five hour episode. It will wrap up quicker at the end. But there's just so much to analyze here. Uh, but that's exactly why we have this show. Now, The characters finally arrive at the island. First of all, uh, rockiest vacation island I have ever seen. Like, this is the most inhospitable terrain. Why anybody would choose this island to go vacation at is completely beyond me. Let's just throw that out there. 
<laughs> we spend our summers in Mordor. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> now, while they're there, Anna wants to talk to Sandro. He's very resistant, says they can talk when they're married, but that's kind of what she wants to talk about, Sandro. She's very hesitant, wants to take a break. He's not having it, right? Now, once again, very interesting little note, as if to reinforce the notion of marriage as this eternal argument, you will notice that in the background of this shot, he has placed Corrado and Julia <laughs> up on a rock above them. So just a little sort of visual reinforcement there about the impossibility of relationships, that third theme. Now, Ryan, this is where we're going to go ahead and we're going to talk about the cinematography and the visual compositions and the overall visual language of the film. Oh, yeah, I think it's baby. probably most expressed during this island search, which ultimately because Anna's about to go missing here. And they really just – I think there's a lot of exploration of the environment that occurs during this scene. Yeah. What was your reaction to the camera, the visuals, the staging, the direction, everything on display here? Yeah, I mean, you got, <laughs> you got a lot going on. Uh, you yeah. have – um, first off, you have the actors in their engagement with each other or the lack thereof. You have a lot of lines being portrayed to each other as their backs are turned or as one actor is facing uh, a character and they're looking away. You have closed framing where, um, you know, open frame is where, uh, you know, an actor will be staged on like one third of the screen looking towards the open side or the empty side of the frame. They'll be staged on the, the frame looking into you know, the closed side of the frame or, you know, so if they're framed on the right of the screen, they're looking towards the right. And uh, you have, like you said, people in the background, you've got uh, the landscapes um, to kind of show uh, that, that are acting as metonyms or metaphors or whatever you want to call it. There's so much going on. The camera movement um, in the way that uh, you're letting people, you know, kind of come and go and the camera is moving around to keep certain people in the foreground and certain people in the background. Dude, it is like, it is insane how much he's throwing at me right away in this. Um, this was even demonstrated in the very first scene uh, with Anna and her father. They just, uh, they, they, um, they give their entire dialogue, their, their little opening speech to each other or whatever, uh, without even making any eye contact or barely looking at each other. Everybody's yeah. very cold to each other. And um, this is all displayed through the blocking, the camera movement, who's in the foreground, who's in the background. Very, very interesting. Absolutely. And it's kind of funny because there were certain times where I will admit that it does feel a little bit like a Calvin Klein commercial. It's sure. all like black and white and like people talking to each other in these very nice outfits and not looking to each other. Apparently it was, they're all looking like wistfully the, into the distance. Like, yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but apparently there was something known as it was either like the Antonioni close up or the Antonioni two shot, but he was kind of known for doing a lot of shots where uh, characters would look away from each other and kind of talk to each right. other over their shoulder. I guess that yes. was sort of like a visual distinction. It's very dismissive. Uh, and cold. Yeah. It, it speaks to the disconnect that people have, right? Yes. Yeah. So, and, and from what I understand, not having, this is the only Antonioni film I've ever seen, so I can't speak to it, but I understand that this is, these are kind of the characters that he plays with in the world that he plays with these very uh, sort of privileged, uh, bored, you know, self-absorbed characters. Well, we're going to get into a lot of that. In. Yeah. I mean, the, the, you know, you, you see physical interaction, um, throughout this film displayed really only to show conflict, imprisonment, power over somebody else, um, uh, freedom of your own sexual power or, or will, uh, and, and taking advantage of somebody. But otherwise, if it's just like personal connection or contact, there's no warmth in this film. There's no eye contact. Uh, you're only making eye contact if you're trying to take something from somebody or use somebody, um, we're going to get to the part, uh, you know, some of the horniest parts where you've got the writer that comes in and everyone's like all trying to get on her because her dress is torn. You've got the part where, um, uh, you've got the part where Claudia is like leaning against the wall and you've got like 4,000 Italian men all like ogling her and all of this. So, yes. um, you know, anytime somebody is trying to make any connection, it's a very selfish one, self-driven one, sexualized one, um, but never a warm one. And that's, you know, going back to what you're talking about when Anna 
turns down Sandro um, at first for physical contact, but then she changes her mind and comes back. To me, that was just an extension of this, right? This very thing where it's like she took it on her terms. She didn't want it when it was like them coming together after not seeing each other for so long, which would have been like the warm I missed you version of that. It's like, no, no, I don't know about this and blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden it's like, Ah, fuck it. I changed my mind. Give, give me that dick. And then, cause that was like her <laughs> kind of owning her own sexual power, but in, in a sense of like, I'm going to take this thing because I want it now, not let's come together. I missed you. So everything is cold and it's all very intentional and you could chase these themes throughout. Um, sure. and not the least of which is this moment on the Island where you've got this operating, I think in three or four different couples, all kind of doing this to each other or with each other. Um, and then you've got the prop work because on this Island in this very moment, uh, one of the, uh, hired hands or one of the folks there finds this old jar, uh, or this old pot and it's this old artifact and they're like, Oh, this is from, you know, old Roman times or whatever the fuck it's this old as fuck jar. And, but it's an antique. (laughs) There was previous civilizations that used to live on the Island. I think is how they put it. This is like evidence of that. We'll call them Sicilians. Why not? (laughs) For the sake of argument. Yes, they live there. And so, um, yeah, I would say that. uh, But then like someone immediately breaks. Like they're all passing it around. They're like, oh, this is so important. What year is it? And like one of them is actually a collector of antiques or or an antiquator or whatever you want to fucking call it. (laughs) Um, Works for an auction house or something like that where he would know what this is. And then they hand it to him and they're like, tell us more about this. And he's like, "Uh." and then he drops it on accident like a total dipshit. And they're all like, just kind of shrug their shoulders. They're like, eh, case okay, like, you know, easy come, easy go. And it's like, <laughs> that's how temporary everything is to them. That yeah. even something hundreds of years old or thousands of years old or whatever it is like that they, by their own admission is very important or special. And, and they're all kind of treasuring it one moment. Then one of them breaks it and they're like, eh, fuck it. And that was the end of that. And so they treat each other with this level of disposability. Um, people are just as, easily pass through their hands and shattered uh, emotions and and feelings and all that um, as this jar. So taking the conversation full circle, you're asking me what I think he's doing on this island. All of that. I think it's all very intentional. And this goes back to what I was saying earlier, where it's like, dude, I think Antonioni is operating on all cylinders for a micro budget uh, against all odds in November in Italy. It's cold as hell. He's got his, one of his lead actresses in the hospital for a coma. You know, the yacht took off. Dude, he's killing this movie. And I love it. Yeah. Like when I, I killing in a good way. He's crushing it. And sure. this is a brilliant film. Um, I give this film all the props, but you really have to watch this several times to get all these things or go down the deep dive or listen to this show and uh to a couple of, you know, yammering fools uh, talk about it for three hours. Uh, what it was going to eventually be three hours, but there's a lot, there's so much to dissect that I guess you could just take this movie, you know, for what it is on the first pass. And then, you know, every lo- time you watch it, you get to another layer, which makes it, you know, uh, sure. reusable. There's, there's a lot of recyclability in this film, which is great. Um, well, you know, that also speaks to what people said about this being a sort of a new language, right? In that, the first time you learn to speak something like you're not going to understand everything, you know, you might get through it a little bit and you'll remember like the big verbs, but like, sure. you're not going to pick up on every little thing. You're just going to have to accept that like certain things I'm not going to get, but I'm going to get through this conversation. I've got enough of an understanding to do so. so I only very- watched it once and it was only because I knew I was coming on this show and I was taking notes and stuff that I did pick up on things like that. Like even yeah. something so obvious and boneheaded as, uh, Claudia and Anna switching clothes. Um, and then eventually Claudia ends up putting on a brown wig and all of the, you know, you start to see her personality changing and stuff like that. She's becoming Anna in these environments uncomfortably. So, um, you know, that, that, that would have even probably washed over me on first pass if I wasn't taking notes and like truly paying attention. And then I'll even go one step further and say that because of the nature of this film, I don't know that I would have enjoyed it as much if I wasn't picking up on those things because, uh, you know, it does kind of force you to learn that language. You're either playing by Antonioni's rules or this movie sucks. There's only, you know, <laughs> seriously, yeah, all, no, you know, no, all you, need, you need to, you're either you in need or you're to come out to it on its level. You can't really right. bring your own expectations. And to your point, yeah, that's why the film doesn't necessarily work on a first viewing is because we're used to speaking one language and that one language dictates that 
this is how this film is going to play out. Okay, sure. this is a mystery. We're going to follow these two people and they're going to be tracking uh, this missing person and trying to get to the bottom of this. It can be a little detective thriller. All right. And then right. it is very much not, you know, even it betrays its audience point, in a lot of ways because it eventually tells you that that mystery doesn't matter anymore. And you're like, yeah, whoa, absolutely. I was in like you. You said we were along for the ride and then I was in for the ride. And now you're like, nah, fuck that ride. Like you're almost <laughs> the ship's captain that abandons the viewer on the rocks of Sicily, just like they did to Antonio in the making of this film. Like he almost yeah. leaves you stranded there at the end of the movie where you're like, wait, what? <laughs> well, that is kind of that red herring uh, opening. And that's what I think is so interesting, sure. you know, is yes. we are set up to believe that this is a film about Anna and it is really not. It's a film the about thereof, Claudia right, yeah. and Sandro, really, at the end of the day. So, yeah. yeah, so we're bringing in expectations based on the language we understand. But then this filmmaker is presenting it in a different way. Again, it's going to be jarring. But the more time you hang in there and stay with it, the more you'll be able to appreciate it. Now, this is also the moment where with look, when Anna goes missing, like there is no fanfare. Like the way that they cut it, it's kind of like. You don't even notice that she's missing. And then all of a sudden someone's like, hey, wait, where'd that Anna chick go? And everyone's sure. like, oh, right. Yeah, where is she? So the way that it's done very sort of casually is really interesting. I did love. There's the no way ominous the musical camera... cues or anything like that, you know. Yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, this is the one time that we actually do sort of get a, a general underscoring of music. And in this case, it was actually uh, with a, a sort of unique jazz composition so i don't know if you saw this but it's pretty much the only piece of music that we hear during the film um outside of the jaunty little ditty that opens the film and it's funny because anton yoni would come to despise music completely so i think by the time he makes the eclipse He's, he's pretty much done with music uh, as a whole. However, he did want to have one piece of music. So his instruction to the composer is that he wanted to make, quote, jazz from the Hellenistic era, which is a period of Greece, for those who don't know, uh, that is between the time of the death of Alexander of Great, but before the rise of the Roman Empire. So basically just like make this make jazz music that's like hundreds of years old from an ancient civilization. And the composer was like, I got you, fam. And that's how he was able to – so he came up with that uh, little ditty. But as the characters continue to search for Anna, we do see that there's this sort of raging wind. And you know, to your point, it is very cold there. We see that, which is reflective of the emotions of the characters. So there's kind of some comparisons going on there. And yeah, you know, a lot of the framing that he utilized, for example, was was considered very novel at the time. The way that he would do these sort of low-angle shots or the way that he – allows his characters' faces to sort of, you know, go out of the sides or the top and bottom of the frame and come back in. And it all kind of adds up to a very specific feel. And this is also where one of the instances happen where that that audiences would have considered one of those moments where, quote, nothing happens, right? That was one of the response of those Cannes audiences is they were like, this film has so many instances where nothing's happening. And if it is happening, it's certainly not important to the story, right? And that's where we talk about that unique visual language. Now, Ryan, with regards to those moments, right? Like there's like as as we continue the film, there's gonna be a lot more of these moments where they're just sort of like one-off moments that seem either disconnected or only slightly tangentially connected to what's going on. And this moment is in particular when they're looking for Anna and they come across that like abode and they think that it's kind of abandoned. And then it turns out that like an Australian guy actually owns it, shows up, yes. starts talking to them in English and saying, like, right. well, you know, maybe your friend, uh, you know, fell off the side and she's uh, floating out in the water there. And they're like, how that happened huh, once yeah, just maybe. last week. <laughs> uh, OK, well, thanks, old crazy man. See you later. And then they yep. kind of peace out. So yep. now what do you think about? scenes like that. I mean, do you think there's merit to the idea that these are sort of unnecessary or maybe not connected? Or do you think that, do you think otherwise? So this is the first scene um, because Anna going missing is like the catalyst that sends us on the real movie, right? That's like yes. the closing of the one chapter where we get into Anna is kind of like the, the MacGuffin of sorts or she becomes as such, but she 
you know, it's the first character we're introduced to. She walks out of the house, meets her father, blah, 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 like we said. Then she introduces us to all the other characters on the boat and so on, Claudia and all of that. Uh, and then she disappears. So she's now served her purpose, and we're going to go on this other ride now. So this is kind of the fork in the road, where we now are led to, to believe we're going to go look for Anna, and we're not. I mean, we kind of are, but that's not what this movie is about. So yeah. this movie, from here on out, this is just the first example of many scenes that follow uh, that are simply meant to keep these characters together, mostly Claudia and Sandro, um, to examine you know, do, do a bit of a character study, if you will, and to make these statements and have all these metonyms and things that you're, we talked about right up front. This is why this show, this episode is going to go by a lot quickly, uh, a lot quicker now, uh, as we move forward, because, um, once you've established these series of events that don't matter really in the context of things, could you have removed this shepherd thing on the Island? Absolutely. Could you have removed the train car scene? Probably. Could you remove that empty city that they go to where there's no one there? It's completely abandoned and all brand new built and everything. And she's like, sounds really echoey. We're going to talk yeah. about that too. Any one of these scenes is very, um, uh, it's all very bloated. Like, that was one of the problems I had, but also one of the things I loved. Um, this film is very divisive in that way because are any of these scenes necessary? Are any of the characters necessary? But then again, is that the very statement itself? Like Antonioni yeah. is kind of making that statement. Like mm -hmm. none of this matters. Like, you know, the, these people not, don't have anything going on. They're all just kind of self-absorbed. And we're going to show you several examples of that. We could even, I could even take these two actors and put them in a completely desolate area like that abandoned city. And we'll still see them perform the exact same way. I could put them in a bustling area, um, like the downtown area where all those people were flocking towards, the writer, we're going to get to that. Yeah. Yep. Doesn't matter. They all still, you know, <laughs> bitches be bitches and assholes be assholes and all of the things. So, you know, uh, in the same way that he was able to so easily swap out uh, Anna's actress for <laughs> his assistant director was a man. He just goes like, none of this matters. <laughs> like it all is so frivolous and meaningless and lonely and isolated. And, you know, uh, and nobody has any attachment to anything. And so when you remove that attachment, and they're not really looking for Anna and it's all about how, you know, and then they start to hook up and all these things. Then you start to realize like, man, this, uh, it really confuses how you feel about this film on the first pass. Again, he's betraying his own audience in a lot of ways. So, you know, I, I'm thinking, you know, that the shepherd that they see in this little hobble is going to give them something of, of meaning. Like I'm waiting as the viewer, like, Oh, he's going to drop a little clue, which is going to go send him to this thing. And he does kind of, you think, cause he's like, yeah, some ships came up. Maybe she got on, you know, one of those ships and they're like, fuck yeah, the ships. So then they go to where the ships are. And then we start to go on this little journey that leads to nothing or nowhere. And they're just following these breadcrumbs. And the further down the road they get, the less they actually even want to find her anyways, because that threatens their relationship. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, let's get to a little bit of a production story. We talked about how this is a very difficult shoot, and specifically, the scenes on the islands were very, very difficult. So this is a cast and crew of 50 people going to an island where 200 people live. 200 people live on this entire island, okay? No electricity whatsoever. Freezing cold. It's supposed to take three weeks. They ended up being there four months Okay. Holy now, crap. Yeah. The first issue, uh, you did, did you see this thing about how they had to transport the equipment to the island? No. <laughs> okay. But I can only imagine. It looks shitty. <laughs> so they initially strike a deal with the Italian Navy. And the Italian Navy is going to help bus all of their stuff to the island. However, Italian Navy decided to have a little bit of a trademark change of heart. I don't know that it's a trademark change of heart, but they had a change of heart at the last minute and decided, you know what? No, we're not going to escort you people over to this island. Good luck getting over there. So what they had to do is the entire crew ended up having to build rafts out of lumber and gas canisters. Old school, rickety ass little rafts that they would then put the equipment on, all of the film equipment, and then tied it to a tugboat and ferried it over to the island. Oh, wow. Now, once they were there, we talked about how unfriendly this terrain was, right? 
that there is yes. no flat ground anywhere on this entire island. Okay? No beach. And they are working with equipment from the late 50s. So right. there's no – heavy little, as shit. You know, yeah, exactly. They had a dolly system that weighed eight tons, okay? And Oof. nobody could use any roads whatsoever. So every single piece of equipment that was used during these four months – had to be physically picked up and moved by the crew. They basically were working from 4 a.m. to 8 p.m. every single day. Oh, how bad would you hate this guy <laughs> after that shoot? That would be the worst. Well, right? Uh, yeah, well, you might hate him a little bit more after what happened soon thereafter, which is that he got a call from his production company. I believe they were in Maria, this is how you say them. And okay. they actually informed him while they were on the island that – this film is shutting down because we have run out of money and Correct. gone bankrupt. I did see that. Yep. <laughs> so they're on this island. They can't get and they can't get off there because they literally can't afford to get off the island. So Antonioni actually convinced his cast and crew to work for free to keep shooting, despite the fact that he couldn't pay them. I would imagine it was something like, "Hey, we're stuck on this island, regardless. Want to at least make a movie while we're here?" Eh, I guess so. Why not? <laughs> Makes you wonder if he didn't uh, pay the the yacht driver to take off and leave him stranded there for a while. Like, <laughs> buy me well, a yes. few hours, man. Yeah, yeah. So that's actually kind of what happened. So all all while they're there, because it's only accessible by ship, they're basically paying ships to come in and deliver supplies in the form of food and blankets and bottled water and etc. Well, once the production company ran closed, there was no money. And they couldn't pay these people anymore. So the ships stopped showing up and making deliveries. It got to the point where they completely ran out of food and bottled water and blankets. Let, let's also acknowledge there's a ton of like insects and giant lizards on this island. It's very cold. So you've already got really unfavorable conditions. Then you can't even feed your crew who's having to spend 16 hours a day hoisting a bunch of crap everywhere. So they Jeez. finally say enough is enough. And they go on strike and they say, we're not doing anything for you anymore until we get paid. And so he's like, well, uh, not really too sure what to do here because we're stuck on the island. My crew won't make the movie with me. I can't get us off. We don't have any money. Navy won't help us out. And I might as well just grab the camera and shoot some scenes with my actors and actresses whenever they're willing. And so he did that when he could. And the rest of the time. He actually spent radioing into the mainland because there was no telephone communications to speak of at all. So he has to use to have an old school radio and he would just call into random production companies on the mainland and explain his situation and see if they would fund him. And it wasn't until three weeks of doing this that this company, Sino del Duca, came in like a white knight and gave him his money. And he could finally pay everyone and get the ships back to make their deliveries and was able to go ahead and finish this scene. That's Just absolute I mean, insanity. So he's Italian Bowfinger. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we're coming down to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A absolutely nuts. Like what he went through to get this thing done. And this is also where, like I said earlier, this is kind of where it could be argued that like the film starts, at least in right. terms of what it's going to be for the rest of the film. We've now pivoted to where, Claudia is going to become our protagonist. Uh, it might be Sandro for a minute, but it's going to become Claudia very soon. And already, like, Sandro's only three days in. His wife, his future wife, who he apparently loves, just went missing. But now he's starting to feel for this Claudia chick. And I think that from there... He's really aggressive in terms of trying to get with her, you know? He's trying to find ways to be alone with her. She kind of keeps avoiding him and rebuffing him, but he kind of, in as you said, that very Pepe Le Pew sort of way, keeps making himself visible, won't leave her alone. And it's actually not until Anna's father, the politician, shows up that the actual Navy is finally there. They've got a helicopter, they've got a bunch of naval vessels, and they do a very extensive search for Anna. And let's also acknowledge this island is really not that large, so it shouldn't take that long. Like, I'm pretty sure they canvass most of it on their own. But either way, they do end up acknowledging that Anna's nowhere to be found, and despite him trying as much as he can, ultimately... 
they're like, Sandro, you've got to go back to the mainland. Claudia is going to stay here. Just just accept it and move on. And he's like, ah, OK, fine. I'll be back for you later, Claudia. So <laughs> this really gets to the heart of the issues that we as an audience have with the film on the first time viewing. Right. Which is we expect this to be a film about this guy going to all lengths to find the woman that he loves. And not only does he not do that. But, like, within 0.3 seconds, he's like, ah, I'm moving on from that bitch. This other chick's kind of hot. And, well, she's here and the other one's gone. So, like, eh, it sounds difficult. But, like, we're going to still do the whole, you know, I'm going to pretend like I'm still trying to find her. I'm still going to go here and follow up on these leads. But, like, eh, we'll see what happens, right? So, and so did they kiss Claudia and Sandro in the shepherd's hole, their, his little hut? Is that so, when they kissed for the first time? No, I'm trying to remember no. when they first. Okay, so they so kissed. yeah, I, I actually did skip past that. I need to apologize because right before he gets sent back to the mainland, there's that scene where he like runs down into the cabin and she's there and he looks at her and he just kind of grabs her and kisses her and she doesn't even really know what's going on. And she kind of looks panicked and just like runs away, unsure of how to respond, which I'm pretty sure is like how any of us would respond in that situation. Yeah. But cause yeah, like so, until moments ago, she was joining her homies fiance to go look for her friend. And now all of a sudden yeah. he's Pepe Le Pew and all over her. And she's like, Whoa, Whoa, what, what, yeah. <laughs> what, <laughs> what, what? just went missing. And your reaction is you're trying to bang me while she's you're trying gone? to woo me. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like what? How serious am I supposed to take any of this? Should yeah. we even be looking for Anna or like, yeah, how am I supposed to take you seriously about me and like your feelings? And I don't know. So it was very predatory and very, very awkward. And again, uh, up until that was probably that was actually the moment where I realized we're on a different journey here because uh, up until that point, I thought we were going to look for Anna. Like, hey, we're going to look for Anna. Yeah. Let's see where Anna's at. In a very Hitchcockian kind of way, but... Yeah, and that's what you've uh, been set up for. Correct. It's even called the adventure. We're going on an adventure, right? <laughs> and then like, oh, different kind of adventure. Take your clothes off, adventure. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I don't know, man. It was... I audibly looked at the screen because I was deeply invested. And by the way, again, visually stunning. Performance is fantastic. I'm all on board for this movie. And then he kisses Claudia. And I was like, no, <laughs> oh no, what is happening here? So yeah, I wanted to make sure we touched on that. Cause that was a very pinnacle moment in this film. Oh no, no, absolutely. I mean, like I said, a anybody that has a problem with this film, it's going to hinge on that. I would have to imagine. I mean, there's going to be people that maybe think it's a little bit slow or they're not into this style of presentation, foreign films, et cetera. But assuming that you're into all that and you're you're down for some La Ventura before you know what it is, yeah, you know, I think that's that's absolutely the case because again, the film sets us up to expect that. It hits right. all those beats in that first half an hour to set us up for that, but it's very intentionally so that it can end up going in a different direction. So yeah. I do want to kind of bring up one thing. So to your point, the first time I watched this film, it was hard to get around that, right? I ended up appreciating the film, liking it reasonably, but I just couldn't get around the fact that, like, dude, like, why why was this guy so quick to move on from his wife? And, like, am I supposed to like him? Am I supposed to think he's a scoundrel? You know, but and then that's when after further viewings, it's like you're not supposed to think anything. We're, we're, we're telling you about these people. You know, this is this is their worldview. Right. You know, I, I don't think it tells us. And I do think that's one thing I appreciate about the film is it's not really telling us to judge these people based on their actions the way that a, a film that had this type of content normally would. You know, it doesn't make any sort of judgments on their characters and their actions. It just kind of says, these are people, this is what they're doing. We'll leave it up for you to decide what you do or don't think about this. But I, I, I wanted to ask you something. Okay. Which okay. is that on, on the surface, like, yeah, of course, like Sandro moving on so quickly from Anna, like it definitely leaves a bad taste in your mouth. However, and we'll 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 debate this specific aspect of it later, but just or a bad taste there, in Claudia's mouth. <laughs> <laughs> there yeah. is a there is a, a take, and I think it's a very reasonable take that uh, Anna ended up leaving of her own accord. 
Sure. Right? And that she wasn't necessarily like nothing happened to her. Like she basically bailed even down to the standpoint of there's a shot Lincoln. You miss it shot right after she goes missing of a boat in the background, actually yep. like going away from the island that yep. some people have posited is actually on us on that boat. And she sure, because they're all selfish people and everything is disposable. Correct. So why would she not be acting on those same impulses? You know what I mean? Correct. She's already yeah, so like faked a shark attack for attention and like testing people and stuff. These people are all bummers, dude. And like, <laughs> you know, and why would she not act accordingly? Once you, especially once you know the whole story, like when you get to the end of the film, and you look back at that scenario, you're like, oh, yeah, she totally fucking bailed. Because if she yeah. died, there'd be all this pomp and circumstance. You'd hear a scream. You'd hear help. There'd be some evidence. There'd be blood. There'd be like a terror of her cl- clothes. I mean, they scoured that island pretty solid. Yes. And even, the, you know, they sent help out to come look for her like the government did or whatever. The local authorities came out and took a statement. All of the things. Because her dad was a diplomat. Let's not forget that. So, like, you know, now why she never turned up anywhere is beyond me you would think that at a certain point in the film or the narrative we'd have found out i mean it could have been kept from us but like the fact that her dad even by the end of the film or her family or friends like the fact that she just left everything behind is yeah interesting and a bit of a mystery to me because she would still need access now i'm looking way too so okay so yeah i'm you're gonna say immediately i would expect someone to say to me you're looking way too far into this ryan it's like no yeah but it's only only training that that everything is meaningful so that said you she needs access to her bank accounts she's a diplomat she's living off of dad dad's money and she's like you know engaged to uh, a wealthy well, person okay, as well. J- just to push back on that real quick, let's also remember that at the time, I, I don't know that this is the time of like, you know, there's obviously no digital bank accounts. I, I don't know. I, All the more reason. Credit cards are a thing. So, but here's the thing. She, she, they could deal in mostly cash. She could very What do you think? She's go got a sack home. of cash somewhere, stash yeah, or something? Go she's home, get a bunch of cash and then bail. I'll go down that road. And, you know, okay. She's That's setting fair. up somewhere. But, yeah. but this is, this is kind of what, what my point is, 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 it, is this, observation allowed me to reframe Sandro's reaction on a second viewing, which really made me okay with everything, which is that oh. if it's the case that she left, okay, why then is it such a big deal for Sandro to have moved on as well? Right. Because she ditched now, him. Yeah. He got dumped. Correct. Because like, if she was dead or in danger, Yes. Um, but, but see, th- but he doesn't know that. So the fact that he's able to move on maybe, right? Like, because again, they, like we, we spent a lot of time on that Island and Antonioni's not gonna, we, we just acknowledge he's not going to go out of his way to tell you what his characters are thinking, sure. but there is definitely a take where Sandro just kind of understands, even if that was a narrative ellipses that Antonioni decided not to show us. There's a very legitimate take that Sandro kind of figures it out and is like, fine, then fuck that bitch. I'm a banger friend. Well, and And I wouldn't necessarily hold that against him at that point either because she left him. I'll go on a different ellipses with you. And that is that it was established in the beginning of the film that he's been gone for 30 days at a clip. You know, he's off doing his thing for business and then he comes back. So she's kind of like a part-time lover anyway, that he's just kind of stashed away with the rest of his things back home that he's able to come and visit when it's convenient for him. And then he goes about his deal. So if he's so willing to have thrown her away or thrown this thing away, knowing that, yeah, whatever, easy come, easy go. Chances are he's been doing this the whole time. He's probably got lovers in other cities because as we find out at the end of the film, spoiler alert, he's, you know, going to cheat on Claudia too and go hook up with some other chick. So, well, and you let's know, run everything's kind too. of disposable and, and uh, temporary to him, uh, as it is to most of the characters in this film. Claudia is probably one of the most, if not the only partially, maybe somewhat kind of sort of stable entity in the whole bit. Um, we've never really been shown, I don't think, throughout the film where she sits stature wise or how she's become involved in this society because it's never been established or maybe it is. And maybe I missed it, but so I'll ask you, was it ever established what Claudia did for a living or, or how she got involved in this debutante style society? No, no. As a matter of fact, really the only, I believe if I have it correctly, the only person's occupation that is readily identified is Sandro because he's a, uh, what do you call it? A consultant. 
Yes, to like an architectural consultant, right? Yeah, yeah, because they have that whole discussion about how if he had pursued his own architecture, she thinks that he would have made some really beautiful stuff. But Correct. he basically spent his life just doing it for the money and, you know, helping other people do their stuff. But yeah, and to your point, we never once see him work. Or we never once see any of them work. So I don't think Claudia, yeah, I, w- I would imagine she's just like a rich. But at least he's coming family. back from work. So we know he has a job and it's referenced he has a job. But I never really found out why she has a seat at this table. Um, you know, some of these people are established as heiresses, uh, like Anna, for example, who comes from money. You know, some of these people are just born into it. Uh, I would assume Claudia is of a similar ilk, um, where she well, we do see have... that she's her friend at least, you know, so they, they, cause she's in that first scene where after Anna has the whole conversation with her father, then they break apart and then she oh, right, yeah. is like, no, no, they're friends. Like, yeah. So we can assume that she probably comes from a very similar type of background right it, we don't get the vibe that she's like the poor girl who's like right right this yeah. rich society or anything like she's very well, much accepted along with everyone else she is but my only point for bringing it up is she's the like probably the most emotionally and mental stable person of the whole bit um yeah, definitely who things are kind of like brought on to her you could see her feeling uncomfortable in these moments uh almost as if she is the avatar for the viewer in a sense kind of sort of where yeah, the closest you know thing we have at least the closest thing we have to go down this journey with us as we're made uncomfortable or we're seeing things that is like whoa what you know she's responding 25 percent of the whoa what so you know she's letting yeah. us know it's okay to feel that way in a lot of ways as we go down this road and now a quick word from our sponsor yeah hi um I'm uh, looking for the offices of Larry Brodka, private investigator. Sure, sure. This is the place. I'm Larry. What do you need? My name's Jackson. A, uh, well, a friend of mine says that you're good at solving problems. Lay down the equation for me. Take one happy couple and you add a loving home and you subtract the missus. It all adds up to one sad husband. Jackson, my guy, it just so happens you're in luck. I'm the best in the biz when it comes to finding missing dames. Oh, that's a relief, Mr. Brodka. And I haven't even told you the best part. See, most other investigators might find your wife, sure. But with me, I won't just find her. I'll have sex with her, too. Come again? Sometimes. Depends how tired I am. Did you just say you would have sex with my wife? Yes, sir. Why would you do that? It's a free service I provide. Sets me apart from my competition. Men pay you to have sex with their wives? Jackson, you're not listening. I said it's a free service. How could they possibly approve of that? It's your classic win-win. The men are happy I find their wives. And the women are satisfied I bring them to orgasm. I'm very good at my job, Jackson. Don't you think there's a scenario where you could maybe find my wife and just let that be that? What do you mean? So, if you find her... When? When I find her? (sighs) When you find her... You know, maybe you could just possibly not have sex with her? Not have sex with your wife? You deny her an extremely enjoyable orgasm of the highest caliber? I'm talking the absolute chef's kiss of orgasms here. Call me old-fashioned, but it turns out I don't like the idea of men having sex with my wife. I mean, I suppose we could try just finding her. You'd be willing to do that? Uh, It's highly unorthodox. Way outside of my usual methods, but... Jackson, I could tell you're a good man who loves his wife. I'd be happy to try this wholly original approach to private investigation with you. Ah, thanks so much, Mr. Brodka. I really appreciate it. And hey, if you change your mind... Oh, I won't. You be sure to let me know. Now let's go find that wife of yours. Larry Brodka, private investigator. I won't just find your wife. I'll have sex with her, too! And now, back to the show. And then from there, we cut back to Sandro. He's on the mainland. Again, narrative ellipses, jump into that. He's with these authorities, and they're interrogating smugglers for leads to where Anna might be. And very quickly, Sandro ends up finding Claudia at a train station, having come back. 
she pretty much begs him to leave her alone. And in a very, again, Pepe Le Pew vibe sort of way, he's like, no, 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 you just got to get used to me. Stick around. You'll, <laughs> you'll, you'll come around. I'm sure you will. No Maybe. means yes. I love you. I'm, I'm pretty sure no means yes. So I'll stick around here. And, <laughs> <laughs> and a funny thing too, by the way, again, getting back to Antonio being on his own schedule, that scene was supposed to take three hours and took two days. So Jeez. a little funny thing there. It's like this the recording of this in... episode, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. From there, Sandro visits a reporter at a newspaper in this small town, says they've received a number of calls seeing her around town. And that's where we get this really weird scene. I will admit, Ryan, there are a couple of scenes. On a whole, the film works for me. On a whole, I, I come to understand it. But even now, after having seen it twice, and again with the commentary and all the sort of stuff, I still think it's the weirdest decision To have this exaggerated scene where literally 400 Italian men are following – she wasn't even a reporter. It was actually revealed that she ended up being a high-class prostitute. So you've got 400 dudes in this like super – it felt like a horror film. Like it felt like the dudes were supposed to be the zombies from Night of the Living Dead. Whoa, and whoa, just whoa. She was a prostitute. Girl. I thought she yeah, was a she writer. Was a pro- no, they introduce her or say she's like a reporter, but she ends up being a prostitute, which is why at the very end, after he gets up and leaves her, she's like, "Can't you just leave me a little something?" And he drops some money on her. Whoa, 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 whoa! Stop the presses. That was the same woman. Yes, that's the same woman. What? Oh my god. <laughs> Yeah, that's her. <laughs> oh, that just oh yeah, baby. I love it. You brought the whole film together for me. I love it. Wasn't it. Even, yeah, it wasn't even a legitimate emotional connection. It was just a prosty that was super hot and into him. Some bitch. Yeah, because she asked him for she's like, hey, <laughs> give me a little uh put a little sugar on it. And he's like, I Yeah, got exactly. You. And he like breaks off a couple of bills. So yeah, exactly. I knew that was a prostitute, but I did not pick up that that was the same woman. From the newspaper place that he's going to like look for clues. But yes, to your point, uh, getting back to the zombie apocalypse of horny dudes that were coming (laughs) after this woman um, that had never seen a woman before. It's like she just walked into a male prison with a fistful of pardons and lingerie. It's like, Jesus (laughs) Christ. I've never seen anything like it. Swarms, swarms of dudes. The reason it stands out like a sore thumb is because it is the exact opposite of... What you are trying to accomplish with this so-called neorealism form. Sure. It is so entirely exaggerated. It's very Nothing exaggerated. Nothing about this scene is at all believable or in the realm of reality. So it's, it's very – I still don't understand the decision to have this very cartoonish, exaggerated scene in the context of a film that's so slavishly devoted to realism. <sighs> Yeah, I mean, you get other scenes like it because you get. Um, well, it happens uh, again to her when she's waiting for him correct outside of the to hotel. Claudia. Yeah. Yes, we get a little and more again, of that, that same, and that was a little yeah, more that's... exaggerated. You get all kinds of like, dude. From here on out, like this was I put here in my notes. Um, this whole movie needs to go to Italian horny jail because, like, it just goes like. <laughs> Over and over again, um, we need to kind of skip through some of these. I mean, because the, the movie does kind of like they go here for clues and they go there for clues. Yeah. Um, and you could dissect a lot of these things. But you've got, uh, you know, this this writer, which I'm just now finding out uh, that the uh, breaking news, she's a prostitute from the end of the movie. <laughs> um, and then that's cranked to 11. Then you've got the 17 year old, um, which we'll get to here next, which is the yep. artist that yep. uh, the that they end up um, uh, her and. and one of her friends and then the 17 year old artist, uh, kid boy, um, end up bonking. And then you got the pharmacist. They go to a pharmacy looking for clues because they're told, Oh, she went here to go get a prescription filled, whatever. And then the pharmacist gets up like totally horny. And he's like, yeah, she was here. What's it to her? And he's like, no, no, I'm asking you. And he's like, yeah, but her though. And he's married and his wife comes yeah. out and she's like, he does this. He's just horny. You know, Italians. <laughs> right. And I'm like, whoa. And like, meanwhile, he's like, you know, looking her up and down with the male gaze and a whole bit like, like she's meat meat. And like Sandro's right there and his wife's right. The pharmacist wife's right there. So there's all these, all this, all this to say that he does use exaggerated performances or sequences throughout the film at times to really, I mean, you call it ham fisted, you know, we've used that word many times. It's very ham fisted when he's making his point 
subtly for so long and then all of a sudden he cranks it and it's like whoa okay and it feels yeah. really out of place but maybe it's like one of those things where it's like say it louder for the people in the back you know so, i don't know man just, like i would i would go i would i would see i would actually disagree with the fact that it's ham-fisted because i think it's a very intentional decision i think that he did exactly what he wanted to do in exactly the way that he wanted to do it Sure. I just don't understand the decision in the context of the other decisions that he's made. It's very strange. It's yeah, it's incongruent. It's, it's inconsistent. Yeah, to yeah say the exactly. Least. And and this is also one of those moments where, you know, not being familiar with the culture, not coming, you know, being a, a person of origin from the country that the film is, where I'm not certain if this is a commentary on these people or if this is an aspect of their culture and society that's kind of a little bit standard enough to the point where they can make a commentary on it. So specifically sure. I'm talking about the fact that like there is so much like open lusting and borderline cheating in sure. front of like either partners or like like so this scene right here with with uh Claudia going to meet Julia and her being seduced by this you know, heavy lidded art student who's just sort of openly lusting for her and makes these very sort of pornographic uh, paintings, right? Right. Like Julia starts macking with him right there with Claudia just there, right? Like, yes. And then she's like, go ahead and tell my husband. I don't care. If we go back she to the insists. beginning, in, yeah. She insists. Then, she's like, if he asks, make sure you tell him I'm up here getting that D. Yeah. Which, which that moment makes sense because he's been such a dick to her the entire time that we get the sense that she's just like, all right, dude, you don't love me. I want to go bang some hot young dude and like right. you had this coming, right? Like treat me better and this shit won't happen. And because they're from the boat actually, ride. And yeah. they, were, they had like a cold relationship on the island and the whole thing. Like this is what- But it's also like, I feel like he's the cold one. Like in those early scenes, like oh, she's of course. always crushed. Right. Every time that he says something shitty to her. So like he, she's this young, beautiful 20 something year old. He's this old ass man who should be lucky to be with her. And for some reason, he's just going to put her down left and right. So I get why she makes the decision and say, you know, specifically, but again, there was just a lot of very, he doesn't even seem casual, to care because they get in a car yeah. shortly after this to go somewhere and he doesn't even ask. Yeah. Yeah, and and we're like, hey, have you seen is, my chick? And and like, no, no, nothing like that. It's all just like, <laughs> hey, get in the car, where I got. Absolutely. And after this, so Sandro ends up showing up, picks up Anna. This is where they go ahead and drive to that small town where Anna was rumored to be seen, but the entire town is empty and boarded, no signs of life anywhere. And then this is actually where we finally get that moment of Sandro and Claudia making love on the hillside, right? Now, what, what did you think about that, right? Like, as you were watching that, was it something where you were like, ah, finally, they've got together? Or was it more like, ah, I shouldn't have done that, dude. Like, you just crossed that line. And like, or was there a different response that you had? Yeah, I mean, at this point, they're still looking, actively looking for Anna. So having not done the research and the deep dives and all of that, first viewing uh, Antonioni Virginal Ryan is thinking, oh, that's going to complicate things. I have here in my notes. Oh, well, that's a pickle. <laughs> I said, that's a pickle that the closer they get to Anna, the further they get from being together. So like now one of the those two things has to give. Either they have to give yeah. up on their search for Anna or they have to give up on this, rela this pseudo sexualized physical relationship that they're engaged now in. So now that they've sealed the deal, um, you know, as I've watched the movie and gone through the deep dive, I'm realizing, you know, now that, or after the fact that none of it really mattered. And then when you get to the end and he ditches her too, then it, that doesn't matter either. So it's like, none of it matters. And that's his whole point, right? <laughs> that's the commentary. I, I believe so. I think that it's really sort of just commenting on, you know, the fact that, these are just lonely and insecure people. I think sure. that right. I don't think that he necessarily and shallow he, and self-absorbed, etc. Yeah, I don't think that he necessarily loves Claudia. No. I think that he thinks he loves Claudia, but I think that Claudia could have just as easily been a Lynn or a Stacy sure. or a Kim, and that would have done just fine, right? I yep. think it's more for him. Like he's so self-absorbed. 
Yes. That he really just needs companionship. He doesn't. It's kind of like when we talked about that moment in Phantom Thread. Yes, I'm glad you brought that up. I have that in my notes. Yes. Yeah, where it's, it's just, you know, the, the they make him feel better about himself. He doesn't love them for who they are. He loves them for how they make him feel about himself. Right. Yeah. She will no longer be dressed by the house of Sandro. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. And then once again, you know, after that, we, you know, they go to the hotel where Anna is supposed to be. Naturally, Claudia doesn't want to go in in case it's a little bit of a situation. She stays outside. She gets surrounded the same way that prostitute lady was before. And again, another Ozu narrative ellipses. We don't see Sandro in there looking for Anna. We just stay outside with Claudia the whole time. We see that she's starting to struggle with the shame of being with Sandro. And we're also sort of sort of seeing those signs where she's slowly transforming into Anna. She's starting to inhabit some of those emotions. She's very much in her head now because of this situation that has developed. But we're also seeing that physically she's starting to reflect Anna with the dark wig and the clothes and all of that. And in wake of some of these negative feelings, they do find themselves at a bell tower and end up having a very sort of refreshing positive experience there wherein they start clanging the bells and then there's another bell tower that starts to respond to them so they have this very sort of like whimsical childlike fun experience of clanging on these bells and communicating with other people and so for just this one moment they're connected right they're connected to the world around them in a way that they are not for the rest of the film which sort of gives a a brief moment of levity we like seeing the happiness that they're bringing because these people are just so forlorn, forlorn for most of the film that it's like, ah, we finally just get to see them be, you know, happy, purely happy and enjoying the moment for even just one or two minutes. And that's kind of nice. Right. And also the the one thing that does give them joy is something so innocent that doesn't cost any money that anybody has access to. It's like, you know, a little bit of commentary that once you step out of this you know, bougie ass world that they're in and get back to the simpler things in life. That's where the joy is just clanging some bells and hearing some bells back. Right. Like it doesn't have to be a yacht to Sicily or, or a convertible drive to go look for your, you know, one lover with your other lover. Like, you know, just something as simplistic (laughs) as being on a rooftop and having a decent conversation, like a normal human being, Um, you know, that even in the abandoned town, you get a little bit of that when uh, she is, hearing her voice echo in the vacated building or whatever. And she's like, you know, you hear the echo. Like it's those little moments throughout the film here and there that are like dribbled in that show that that's when they get a little bit of joy in their life. It's the simple things. Absolutely. Like a lollipop in my mouth and butter in my ass. (laughs) Exactly (laughs) like that. I know that's my default happy place. (laughs) <laughs> for the boogie nights fans in the audience <laughs> now from there we actually approach the end of the film okay it's so our final scene the two of them are going to check into a hotel and claudia is just madly in love with sandro at this point she's doing that thing where she's singing the love songs into her hairbrush as she gets dressed sort of traipsing around the room seductively. Walking on sunshine, yeah. Exactly, big gestures, swinging on uh, bedposts and stuff like that, and just couldn't be happier. She kind of wants a little bit of Sandro at this point, expression of that love, but he's not really into it. He seems distracted, and he ends up going outside. This is where we get the moment that we referred to earlier where he sees the artist who is drawing the architecture, knocks over the ink on his paint, on his drawing, rather, uh, the artist gets pissed off, challenges to a fight. He ends up leaving in that little sort of procession. And riled up, he goes back to Claudia. And now he's like ready to get into it and get down and dirty. But like, it's not exactly feeling like he wants to make love to her. It more feels like he's trying to work through some aggression or something like that. And uh, of course, you know, because of that, uh, she's not into it, right? She doesn't want to, to go down this way. So she kind of uh, rebuffs him. And it's it's later that night that kind of sets up the whole final scene where, you know, he's calmed down. He comes back. He tells her that this is the first time that he actually tells her he loves her. Right. She actually asks him to say, I love you earlier. And he kind of does the like, I don't have to say it, baby. We both know it's true. I don't have to say it. Yeah, <laughs> come on, right. Uh, and so this is the moment where he finally says, uh, I love you. And then he actually, you know, very sweet. Like she asks him to say it again. And he's like, no, I don't love you. And then he, 
he leaves and comes back and is like, nah, I'm just kidding, baby. I do love you. So, you know, they're kind of being sweet together. Uh, but of course, that's just going to set up the, you know, downfall to quickly come because now he's going to just go out on the night. You know, it's a big party hotel, right? Like there's this huge sort of party going on in the lobby and everywhere. He's kind of walking around and he gets the attention of, yes, that prostitute who has actually shown up. And he goes into the lobby to maybe watch some TV. And we get a cut to the next morning of Claudia waking up in the hotel room in her bed and Sandro's not there. So she's going to go look for him. She searches the hotel. We've seen all of the sort of strewn confetti and leftover beer bottles and all this sort of stuff. Apparently had a hell of a rager the night before. And there are two people in one of the rooms laying down on the couch, making out. One of them is the gorgeous prostitute. The other is our boy, Sandro. And so she finds him and she looks, you know, understandably mortified and, you know, hand to her mouth and, and you know, turns and, and runs away. But but that's not the reaction that I want to talk to you about. OK, so Sandro's reaction to being caught in the moment, I think, is one of the most interesting reactions and such a well acted moment in this film. Sure. And it's so reflective of character and theme and all of this. Because when he is caught, he basically just has arguably the most pathetic response that one could have. He doesn't try to say this isn't what it looks like. He doesn't just be like, screw you, lady. He literally hides his face. He turns his face down and buries it in the prostitute's like belly, so to speak, like a dog, right? Like, like. Like how a dog thinks if it doesn't make eye contact with you, the thing is not happening, right? Or an right, ostrich right. that buries its head <laughs> in the sand. It's like, nope, not making eye contact. You didn't find me. This never happened. And I wanted to see what you thought about how that moment plays against everything else that we know about Sandro and this entire journey that we've been on with him. So I almost kind of, I took that as almost like a reboot yeah, of sorts. Like, he buries his head and he's like, uh, well, I guess that's done. What next? And then because we see him come back yeah. and then he breaks her off some money after she asks for, for some money. And then uh, we see him walk off. So he doesn't cry. He doesn't. Um, he just takes a minute to kind of recollect himself. And I think maybe that moment is spent disposing of any emotion or like wrestling with no fight it back. You know, don't, don't feel it. <laughs> don't feel really? the feelings. Okay. And then, uh, you know, he kind of regroups. He's like, mm, Nope, Nope. You know, I'm a big boy, big boy, big, you know, do big boy <laughs> things. He's like, yeah, that's right. You know, and then he, he gets back and he kind of recollects himself. And then we see just like a little glimmer of Sandro, but then, you know, always, obviously with the weight of, what he now has to go deal with or contend with, you know, but sure. It's like a mess. He has to clean up almost, you know, but in, in, I think that, I think there is a brief moment in time where he does feel shame, but it's sure. kind of like when he peels his head back from the bosom of the prostitute woman, um, I feel like he's kind of regroup with like recollected himself and he's like, no, nah, you know, that ain't me. And then we see him kind of go off and, uh, uh, fight back those feelings of sorts. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I actually had a different take on it. I thought that okay. it was, I, I really, en I really appreciated the moment. Let's say enjoy probably isn't the right word, but I appreciated the moment because I thought it was such a simple gesture that does so much work to reinforce the three central themes. Like, okay. if you, it, like it's almost like a creative exercise of like, here's all this information. I need you to find one gesture that successfully ticks off the boxes of reinforcing everything that came with it. And I so I it. love that moment. And part of it is because I don't, I, I, the way that I saw it, see, I think that he's hiding, right? Like I said, I think okay. it's like the dog. I think yeah. that in that moment, he's so incredibly ashamed and it's basically the don't look at me scene, right? Don't look at me. Don't look at me. I'm ashamed, <laughs> but I can't stop. But don't look at me. I don't want you to see me do this, but I'm still going to do it, right? I'm like, I think not it was... an animal. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was that. I think it's don't look at me while I do this thing that I'm very ashamed of, but can't stop myself from doing. And so I think that, A, 
reinforces the notion of the theme of these being incredibly self-absorbed characters, right? In the lead up to that moment, he never stopped to consider Claudia. Or if he did, she was just a brief blip. And then it was back to, well, what do I need? And what do I want to do? I want to bang was this right hot chick upstairs. that's giving me fuck me eyes, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yes. She was right upstairs. He doesn't care because he's in his own world. And it's not until he's taken out of it that he goes, oh, shit, I did a really bad thing. And right. And hits his face in shame. Yeah, now, like a child. Now, yeah. The second theme, uh, sex is a distraction from life. They, they may not be having actual intercourse, but I think we're supposed to assume that they would if they could or that they may even be leading up to that. And then, of course, the third, the impossibility of relationships. I, I don't even have to explain that. He, sure. he just can't he just can't have a relationship with a long term relationship with anybody, even this chick, Claudia. So as soon as we're past that honeymoon phase and things get serious and we have to have an actual relationship, he bails by, you know, getting with this chick and everything and everyone is disposable and temporary. Yes. Yeah. And I think that he does end up he may not cry in the moment, but he is crying by the time he gets to the bench outside. And I think that it's a cry of shame. I don't think that it's reflective of anything else. I think he's crying because he's, in that moment, a pathetic man. He's he's crying because he did bad, but he's also not acknowledging that he did bad. He's feeling sorry for himself instead of trying to go to her and make things right. Again, because right. he's such a self-absorbed person. And yeah, so I think it was that, the exposure that that uh, of of his sins that he was crying about, not that he lost Claudia. That's yeah, how I took correct. it anyways. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. He, uh, again, he just, he's, he's reminded of the, it's that sobering moment, right? You've talked about it before. You've mentioned uh, the sobering trip to the bathroom or something. It's like, right. Oh, this was all fun and games, but like, Oh shit, this is the reality of what I'm doing. And turns out it's kind of fucked up and not good. And I want to reconsider some things here, Sandro. So, and then we get the final scene where, you know, Claudia has run out to this courtyard and she's, you know, looking forlorn out at the environment and Sandro slowly, very pathetically walks up, moves past her to this bench and sits down and start, you know, hand in his heads, starts crying. We don't really see him like, you know, convulsing crying, but there are definite tears uh, that we will see in, you know, the following shot. And Claudia basically goes up to him, stands behind him. We're going to wait for a minute, see what she does. And ultimately, she caresses his head in a very, very accepting manner that he probably and most certainly, in my opinion, does not deserve. And so, Ryan, what I would like to ask you about this moment is what does this very last shot and her action of rubbing his head what does that signify to you? And do you feel that it's deserved or justified or would you have liked to see it go in a different direction? Yeah. I mean, nothing matters. This whole movie is just kind of beating you over the head with the temporary, you know, flighty nature of relationships and love and sex. And, and like you said, self-absorbed and all of that. So these people deserve each other. It's, it's very much again, like the end of phantom thread when we ended in the bathroom scene with over the puke bucket after them just coming to terms with the fact that uh, she was going to have to poison him with mushrooms to get him to be vulnerable. Like these are just, it's actually really interesting. Uh, I hadn't thought of that until you brought up, you know, this movie, like how similar this is to Phantom Thread as well. They're both kind of making similar statements in a way, um, except for that the female lead in Phantom Thread wasn't a debutante. She was brought into that world and trained as such. Um, so she was kind of trained to be that way, but yeah. Um, and one could argue that Phantom Thread ends over the concept that this is what it's going to take for two people of this caliber to come together and meet in the middle to love each other. Whereas I would argue La Ventura, uh, Antonioni is making the point that love can't exist for these people, but they need to learn to accept each other despite that. Um, if they're going to have any kind of connection whatsoever, otherwise they're just going to be ping pong their way through life from experience to experience. And we might ellipses our way out of this scene into the next where, you know, one could only imagine that this wouldn't, is never going to work out. Like this is on such rickety infrastructure and foundations throughout all of this, that it's only meant to be temporary in the first place. It's been, uh, it's, it was designed from the get to be a temporary structure of passion and lust and, and, uh, excitement, uh, again, in a world where these people can't find a thrill anymore 
Um, so I also kind of, uh, understood this to be, you know, this is an exercise to demonstrate loneliness and, and, you know, lack of communication, uh, a lack of openness or, or comfortable to be open. Uh, and, and just like I've been saying this whole time, just a, a level of unfulfillment against a modern world or against a modern backdrop, you know, so much that I found online and all the, the breakdowns of this movie and all the critics and stuff have shown that, you know, so much is shown to like the, the, the town that was built up and then left vacant or when they're on the rooftop and he's talking about his career and in the background is a, an old basilica or church, and then they're building new buildings all around it. Uh, it's about the new taking over the old and how everything is moving at a rapid pace. Everything is always in construction in the background. And, um, you know, as such, you know, with this introduction of a new fast paced Italy, again, post-war, just like we talked about in Tokyo story, um, and everybody focused on, so focused on their career and the daily grind, that hustler mentality, personal relationships get left at the door. And we saw it in the family uh, structure in Tokyo story. And now we're seeing it in friends and lovers and sexual relationships and all of that in love and tour Um, and it's, it's really interesting to me too, because this is a concept that until, you know, I started uh, really dissecting movies like Tokyo story and love and and all of that. I kind of always assumed that we all understood this to be a modern problem, you know, with, uh, you know, the birth and dawning of social media and the internet and everything moving at a fast pace, all of us kind of retreating into our homes and not connecting with each other personally in bars and restaurants. I was like, oh yeah, this is a very new problem. This feeling of loneliness and isolation in a modern world, in a modern society where we're all texting, not talking on the phone. We're all on our uh, phones, even when we're together, we're looking down at our screens and all of that. You know, we see uh, there have been short animated films that have demonstrated this, how, you know, lonely this new industrialized electronic e-world is um, that corporate greed is forcing us to uh, be addicted to social media and the new the newest trends and all these things so that we neglect our families and our friends and the simplicity of life. Then I watch a movie like this and I realize, oh shit, like this is just humanity. This is like, this has always existed because there's always that next thing. There's always a new age. There's always uh, a, a next generation that's making the last generation feel old or neglecting them or whatever. Like, you know, when, when cavemen invented the wheel, you know, all of a sudden then it's like the other cavemen are like, well, that guy's like going places, you know, we, we don't need to like know each other anymore. <laughs> Let's all get on this wheel and go somewhere. So I kind of feel like technology's, I guess, always stolen our heart and soul a little bit because even back in 1960, they're making these commentaries that I felt was a, you know, modern technology problem. I thought that was a big tech problem uh, that has been introduced only in the last decade or two, but uh, not so much. Apparently... That was happening even back then. Nice. Yeah, I, I think there's definitely a lot to that. Uh, I saw it uh, you, somewhat similar, but also just a little bit different in the fact that I think that really what's going on here at the end is it's sort of like she's basically accepting him as this heavily flawed person that really can't change just in spite of everything that they've gone through. And at the end of the day, I think that she holds the power by giving him that for forgiveness, you know? Right, and right. One, yeah, and one can even argue that the film really utilizes at the end uh, the visual metaphor over metonym. We spent the whole episode talking about this whole idea of like visual metonyms. And I would say that the ending is like the one time where that's really betrayed because of the volcano. I think the volcano is supposed to be a visual metaphor for their relationship and the fact that it's going to be very turbulent and very violent. And even the way that, you know, very sort of like haunting almost like thriller jazzy music at the end comes in. It doesn't leave us feeling good about their relationship. 
And I think that's really, like I said, what that whole visual metaphor with the volcano is about. So sure. really interesting film here, though, in La Ventura. It should have ended and... with Freebird by Skinner. That would have just... <laughs> <laughs> I can't change! <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, the, the, they probably would have if they could have afforded it, uh, not knowing that it would still be several years until it came out. So let's hey. just not worry about the chronology of these events here at all. Well, and it's like a two and a half hour movie and Freebird is like a 14 minute song. I think it works perfect. <laughs> Let's just crank this baby to three hours and end it with Freebird. Absolutely. And that is our discussion of La Ventura. We really hope that you enjoyed it and learned some things here with us today. Hey, one thing we, we hope you're still to... here. This has been a long as fuck episode. So thank you all for sticking around. If you're still yeah, listening right good now, stuff, thank I God. would argue. I yeah. mean, I think, I think everything there, it's, you know, we talk about... Uh, you know, oh, X movie didn't have a lot of meat on the bone. I feel like this was all meat, you know, no, all meat. no sizzle, just all steak. Yep. So uh, hopefully everyone listening agreed. If you did, or even if you didn't, we sure would appreciate it if you could uh, help us out by giving us the old subscription and leaving us a review on wherever you listen to your podcast. We greatly appreciate it. It does help get us some visibility, let some people know we're out there. And before we go ahead and get into some contacts, let's go ahead and wrap this up formally. Ryan, I'm going to go ahead and toss to you first. Let's hear what are your three adjectives, sir? So my first one is bloated because it is. I feel like there's a lot. I mean, it's a long movie where a lot of this stuff is kind of extraneous. And, you know, you could enjoy if you're a film critic or a person like us with a podcast or whatever, there's a lot of meat on that bone to, to really tear apart and get to. But if you're a person trying to watch a movie and just enjoy a movie, um, there's a lot that you could probably have scraped out um, or taken out because uh, in the end, a lot of the the scenes here were a little extraneous. My next one is confused or confusing because of the rug pulling out scenario. Um, you know, this isn't, a straight ahead narrative. Um, there's a lot of little moving parts going on. And uh, uh, on first viewing, if you're not taking notes or if you're not going to go research this after the fact to figure out what he was trying to say with certain things like we did, it can be a little confusing. And I think it's an adjective worth using. Um, uh, real quick, I want to take a quick side note, a sidebar, and just say that um, this is another film like Tokyo Story where the... Uh, kind of discussions or the, the reputation of this film doesn't necessarily match up with the film itself. Like uh, people really talk about like this was on sight and sound, uh, sight and sound magazines, critics top 10, just like Tokyo story has been for a while. So, um, I think that uh, sometimes you, you know, you hear that and you're like, Oh yeah, classic Italian film. Like I want to see that. And then you watch it and it's like, doesn't really match. This isn't a film for just everybody. I would recommend this to very few people. So uh, that's why I just put confused and confusing because uh, it's not, it's not as straight ahead as like, like I said, like a Hitchcock film. It's not that kind of confusing. It's not a Shyamalan confusing. It's, it's uh, yeah, it's something all its own. And then the last one is marinade because this is a movie you really need to marinate on. It's better this movie is going to be better the longer you sit on it or stew on it. It's going to be re better with repeat viewing. Uh, I, I mentioned at the end of Tokyo story that I would watch that movie again. I would say that I cannot wait to watch this movie again. Um, because I really enjoyed this one because of the camera movement, because of the blocking, the cinematography is more interesting. It has music throughout, um, you know, Tokyo story. We talked about it being math, uh, this is back to more of that, you know, westernized ballet uh, cinematography, you know, where there's you're going places, baby. You're moving and shaking like spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. Right. So that's kind of Antonioni is going to give you those deep concepts. He's going to make social commentary just like Ozu did, but he's going to give you the sugar. You know, I mean, there's almost titties in this movie. Uh, that's going to get a, at least one thumbs up from Ryan. <laughs> you know, yeah, nice almost yeah, there's almost sure. cities here jason uh, that's <laughs> almost <laughs> so close Ugh. now uh for my three adjectives here uh what we've got is i went with uh dense obviously there's like we just said a lot of meat on this bone here as evidenced by the length of this episode i have unconventional for all the different reasons that we discussed here today, all of the unique approaches that Mr. Antoniani took for better and or worse, as well as my third adjective, complex. 
Once again, there's just a lot to uncover here, a lot to unravel. Things are not what they appear on the surface. It's not what you expect given the way things are set up and the way that they finish. All of this making for a very, very interesting experience. Ryan, why don't you go ahead and uh, formalize this bad boy and give us your grade rating for La Ventura? Well, I know earlier I kind of compared this to... uh you know, Tokyo story a little bit. This was a similar experience where the more I marinated on this, uh, the better off, uh, this movie kind of sat with me and, uh, and I really appreciated it. You know, I did the deep dive and, uh, learned a lot about filmmaking styles, uh, and the language of Antonioni and all of that. So I started giving this a C plus, uh, walking out of the theater. I kind of agreed with the original crowd way back in, uh, cans, not con. Uh, <laughs> so and uh, but now I have upgraded this to a B plus. Um, nice. This is a good film. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed this. I don't know who I would recommend this to because you kind of have to do the work. Uh, it doesn't really just come at you at face value. You kind of have to sit with it and digest it. You have to be in the mood for one of these kinds of films. You know, uh, Tokyo Story was the same way. This isn't a popcorn movie. This isn't something you could put on on a Sunday afternoon with the fam. Uh, This is something for filmmakers uh, to really appreciate. But man, if if you're in that mood, there's a lot to appreciate about this. And uh, so, yeah, I'm going to give for for all those reasons, I'm going to give this a B plus. How about you, Jason? Nice. Yeah, I had the same. I actually gave this an entire uh, star bump up after the second viewing and all the research. Nice. And so and say, just like you, you know, walked out of the first viewing with the same problems that you and everyone else had not understanding what they were going for. And after, you know, the second viewing and the commentary watch and all this sort of stuff, bumped it up a whole extra star to four and a quarter out of five stars for La Ventura. Nice, nice. And I could easily yeah. see that going up to like four and a half after one more viewing. I think it's just a movie that definitely becomes more appreciable the more that you watch it. So, right. And I will watch this again, too. This was a lot yeah. more palatable than Tokyo Story, which had you sitting down and focusing on a lot of things. We discussed all that. This was... You know, you were moving and, and shaking and going places, and uh, I really appreciated the pacing of it uh, and the characterization and the acting and all that. Now that I know what this movie is, <laughs> after watching it one full time, I think the second pass is going to be, you know, really good. And I'll probably pick up some stuff I, I didn't uh, gather from the first viewing as well, even that stuff we didn't discuss today. So, yeah. Awesome. Absolutely. Now, if you want to get a hold of us, a couple different ways. You can go ahead and hit us up on the social medias at Esoterica Cinema. You can also hit us up on email, esotericacinema at gmail.com. Let us know all of your muffin-related stories and ask us anything you want about the show. And then, of course, we have the Esoterica Cinema Hotline, where if you call in, you can leave a message and we will get you on the air. Haven't had a lot of uh, people calling in here, so I really want to implore you guys to go ahead and give that number a call. I'd love to hear you. I'd love to get you on the air. Let us know what you thought about La Ventura or even just our review right now if you haven't seen the film yourself. That number, 818 483-6285. Do call. We'd love to get you on here. And I mean, since since Twitter has hit the iceberg of Elon Musk and is a sinking ship, uh, (laughs) I think that the future is phone calls now. That's none of us are going back to fucking Facebook. So (laughs) (laughs) we were just ahead of the curve there is all that was. Yeah, right. uh, Of course. See on the phones, everybody. (laughs) Phone lines are open. (laughs) We're going back. We went away from them and now we're going back to them. Uh, Life coming full circle as it does. And then, of course, we do have the website, esotericacinema.com. We've done a lot of work on there. There's a lot of great artwork and different logos and stuff that you can check out. We've also got all of our episodes on there for you to listen to just through the web. We've also got access to the dedicated web player. And then, of course, we have our master list, our master list of 200 films that we use to choose from every single episode. And we're going to do that once again right here. Let's get into it, Ryan. Hell yeah, buddy. Let's see how my week's going to go. All right, Ryan, going to our random.org true random number generator as we do every single episode. Come in here, clicking on the numbers. Once again, if you'd like to play along, go to esotericacinema.com. There is a live PDF. You don't even need to download anything. You can just see all three pages right there. And we're going to go ahead and select our number. Click here. Da, 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 da. Wheel spins. Comes up with a number 53. 53. So once again, if you're on that website, go ahead and look at number 53. Now, I will tell you right now what it is not. It is not number 52 Forbidden Planet, 
which, uh, yeah, I would have loved to have checked out that one. I've seen that once before. Don't remember a ton of it. A uh, French animated film from, I want to say, the 70s, if not the 60s. And then, of course, uh, after that is Frailty, which I, I, I know both of us are big fans of. It's been a while since I've seen that one. Going to be nice when we do get to check that one out again. Yeah, no doubt. And uh, But for now, we're going to do number 53, Four Lions. Nice. This is one that I've been meaning to check out for a while. I know you have as well. And yeah, no doubt. I remember hearing about this when it came out. It was kind of controversial, but a little silly. I didn't know how to take this, like which way they were going with this. Um, you know, a comedy about terrorism. Well, let's see how that's about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely really hasn't been done before. And certainly it sounds like not in this way. Ryan, do you have a description for us? Uh, I do right here on Google it states a group of young Muslim men living in Sheffield, uh, Great Britain, I assume, uh, decide to wage jihad and they hatch an inept plan to become suicide bombers. Omar played by Riz. Am- oh, wow. Riz Ahmed's in this. And Waj played by Kayvon Novak have a brief disastrous run at a Pakistan training camp. While Faisal played by Adil Akhtar works on an unlikely scheme to train birds to carry bombs. <laughs> their ill-conceived plan culminates at the London Marathon with their bumbling attempts to disrupt the event while dressed in outlandish costumes. This is from 2010, directed by Chris Morris. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this one. It'll be nice to get some lighthearted fare. Well, as lighthearted as uh, comedy about terrorism. <laughs> can be, I guess. Good old lighthearted <laughs> terrorism. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm laughing already. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, there's a palate <laughs> cleanser to like Tokyo Story and uh, you know, a yeah, lot of terror, yeah, no, so. no, I'm sure it's gonna be good. I, you know, it's it, I, I've read enough to f- know that and probably assume that it, it manages to walk a line. You know, people are pretty enthusiastic about the film in a way that I'm sure they wouldn't have been had it, it not been done with a certain amount of care. So I am looking forward to it very much. We shall see. And this uh, once again has been La Ventura. Thanks everybody for joining us for this discussion. We will see you next time right here at Esoterica Cinema. Enjoy the movies.